What's crack a lacking? What's happening? You know who I am, man. I'm the G with the PhD. You tuned in to the Green Gorilla Channel. It's the place where black men can express themselves freely, straight up with no chasers. You know what it is. They say, where you at, G? Where you at? Been chilling, man. Been chilling. Uh-oh, got a guest with me, man. What's happening, Rasheed? What's happening, Jay, Jay Bones? What's happening, Barry Little? What's good? What's up, Marcus? What's up, The Thinker? What's up, Dollar Will? Mr. LBN? Hasim Aju Jalil? Oh, I got a guest with me, man. What's up, Doc? What's cracking with you? What's going on, man? How you doing? What's what's popping? <laughs> <laughs> what's for popping? You, Waiting for you. Hey, man, look, I'm about to get it started, baby. Uh, first things first, man. You know, no introductions today, man. You know, uh, I want to wish everybody a happy new year, man. I hope you had a Merry Christmas and all of that. You know, even though I don't really get into uh, Babylon holidays and, uh, you know, but it is a time when you can, you know, uh, get some rest in, some recreation in and, you know, where you could actually uh, spend time with your family. And so, uh, oh, we got another guest coming in. There he is. (laughs) (laughs) There he go. (laughs) <laughs> what's going on what's going on what's going on peace and blessings brothers hey man you know peace and blessings brother peace and blessings <laughs> peace and hair grease you know what i'm saying no yes, guarantees sir, shout sir. out to no guarantees man dr j dr j what's happening what's good with you man we got the guest <laughs> league in the house Hey, man, the Justice League is here, man. The three musketeers, we have no fears. We have no tears. <laughs> All I'm picturing is, hey, man, you the seven up man in this joint, man. That laugh, baby. <laughs> hey, man. But, uh, you know, again, you know, I, <clears throat> I'm not, you know, uh, Getting back into, you know, what they call the blue pill or nothing like that. I ain't got no new chick or nothing like that. I'm so I'm ducked off or something. I'm just, you know, I'm working on something right now. You, you'll see what it is in a minute, but I'm working on a little something. And, you know, I get tunnel vision. And when I get tunnel vision, you know, I got to run right through what it is I'm trying to get through. And so, therefore, you know, uh, I've been kind of absorbed. But, you know, I feel like Rakim, it's been a long time. I shouldn't have left you. <laughs> Without a strong rhyme, <laughs> step two. <laughs> yeah, think of how many weak shows you slept through. Time's up. I'm sorry I kept you. <laughs> Shout out to Barry Little, man. Shout out to Barry Little, man. Shout out to him, man. Shout out to him. But you know, we uh we got a serious question, man. You know, uh, and we have a serious topic to cover today, and you know, uh. It's this question about black nationalism, you know, and uh, <clears throat> let me preface my comments by saying this, you know, I was born in the 70s, okay? Uh, I was born in 1971, in fact, so I, I guess that would make me what, a Generation Xer or something like that? That's what they call us? Right, right, right. Okay, um, and you know, that was like... <sighs> Seven years removed from the passage of the Voting Rights Act. Mm. You understand what I mean? Uh, You know, less than 10 years, black folks didn't have the the right to vote and they couldn't go get a house where they wanted to. I mean, segregation was in full tilt. Right. You know, uh, within 10 years... Of the day in which I was born. Mm. And so, you know, the mentality of black people was a little bit different than what it is today. And, you know, they had a little hope and they had a little, you know, uh, desire that, you know, something better was on the horizons or what have Mm -hmm. you. Uh, But yet and still... You know, we have to cover the subject matter 
of unity. I mean, you know, I, I sympathize with the idea that black people need to be united politically, economically, and socially in order to build a better, you know, future for the children. You know what the black national Negro anthem is. I believe the children are the future. Teach them well and let them lead the way. Show them all the beauty they possess inside. <laughs> Give them a sense of pride <laughs> to make it easier. Let the children's laughter <laughs> remind you of how it used to be. <laughs> I mean, but you 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 understand though, right? Yes, sir. <laughs> you understand. I mean, you know it. It would be <laughs> ideal. It would be optimal. It would be. You know, a supreme and beneficent, you know, happening if black people could actually get their stuff together and, you know, <laughs> unite, you know, like form like Voltron. There you go. <laughs> but that's not happening, though, is it? Oh, my God. It's not happening. Oh. It's not happening. And once upon a time when you would say the words... What time is it? Black people would say, it's nation time. Right. It's nation time. What time is it? <laughs> <laughs> Not for Moore's Day. <laughs> but you know, if you said, What time is it? It would be, it's nation time. Oh. We talking about Afros and Dashikis. And go. black people, you know, Basically saying, hey, you know, we need our reparations. We need better. Nice. I don't know what it is, bro. What, what is it? Oh. <laughs> what is it? We have fallen so far. So far. And so, you know, shout out to 3000 GT Atlanta. You know, shout out to him. Appreciate the... Uh, Appreciate the, hey, I, I'm trying to make a dollar out of 15 cents. You feel me? So it is what it is. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that. And also, I appreciate uh, Anthony Davis. Appreciate you, sir. Show you right, man. Show I show appreciate you, bro. Appreciate that. But, I mean, let's get to the subject. At hand. I, know I ain't been here for a minute, so people pretty, you know, pretty much dialed out about what I'm talking about. But I, I really wanted to cover this subject because... A lot of people place, you know, the distance from black nationalism, they, they place it upon the heads of black men. And I'm here to say, that's not the case. But Black men didn't walk away from black nationalism. Uh-oh, 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 uh-oh. And for all you brothers out there, I don't care if you're an activist, a scholar, you know, uh, 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 whatever you may be. I'm here to tell you, you know the truth, but the truth is hard to bear. It's difficult to accept. Because to accept it would mean that you have to deal with an inconvenient truth. Mm. Mm. <laughs> and you know what the truth is. We know what the truth is. Ooh. And we're going to talk about the truth today. We're going to talk about it. We're going to have a conversation about it today. And we're going to do so. I'm going to play snippets from a video. I sent each of you the video. I'm pretty sure you got it, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, shout out to Javon Thompson. Appreciate that. And uh, thank you, Jason Bass. Appreciate that, man. Appreciate the support. Make Mike dance. Make Mike dance for some bands. <laughs> Because I sure ain't going to dance for no bands. I ain't dancing. I'm going to let Mike do the dance. But, but at any rate, let's look at this thing. Let's look at this flick, bro. And I'm going to interrupt. Any of y'all can interrupt while I'm wa we watching this. All right. Okay, but if you didn't know, you know, the video will explain that, you know, 
1972, one year after I was born, there was a black national convention that was held in Gary, Indiana. And you had black people there in mass, politicians, artists, all sorts of people. And on their mind was black nationalism. Their aim, their goal, their philosophy, their political orientation was black unity. And then you look around, it's 2022, man. Where's the unity? Like, like that old group, man. Well, I forget what the name of it is, man. The, uh, the, the, the three black eyed peas or whatever. The, the black eyed peas. Where's the love? Where's the love? Do you see any love? Oh, I see plenty of love. It ain't just come, but it ain't coming to black men. <laughs> But it ain't about it ain't about external love. Mm -hmm. It's about internal love. Mm -hmm. It's about self-respect, self-determination. It ain't about scapegoating for a check. It's about family and community. That's what it's supposed to be about. Mm -hmm. But all that changed. Mm -hmm. And did we change it? Collectively, did black men change it? There's been certain people, you would think so. Hmm. Certain people are very comfortable putting whatever ails the black community at the feet of black men. So let's get right to this, man. I, I'm not going to spend, you know, uh, too much. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to put y'all on this view where y'all are a little smaller than me, not because I'm trying to grandstand, okay? But so we can watch this thing together. And uh, I, I guess y'all are still visible. You see, everybody can see that. I'm pretty sure y'all can see that. So what I'm gonna do is get to the proceedings this evening, okay? And, and the proceedings are to talk about black nationalism and to see it and to have a, a real substantive conversation about it. Because people are now, you know, actually having a robust and a sincere, honest conversation about this. Mm -hmm. And how black that, uh, nationalism was derailed from black, uh, black politics in general. Mm -hmm. Okay? So let's take a gander at this. Okay? And tell me to stop if I need to stop. Okay? First and foremost, I just want to say, all you got to do is look at the names there. Did you see those names? Yep. Okay. Let me let me let me let me go back just a, a, a quick yeah. second. A lot of stars. So we got we got we got to stop and look at the names of the people who were there. Okay. We got to look at the names. The Black Political Convention, the National Black Political Convention. We got Amiri Baraka, mm -hmm. Congressman Charles C. Diggs, mm -hmm. Mayor Richard Gordon Hatcher. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, if, if you don't know who Amiri Baraka is, mm -hmm. and you don't know about the Black Arts Movement, man, you, you got to go back and do your homework. You feel me? 
you got to do a little bit of homework. But we're not just talking about, you know, guys fronting for the public. This is the real deal right here. Mm -hmm. You get what I'm saying? You're talking about people who are seven years removed from segregation, bro. Mm -hmm. And that's important for people to understand. You're not talking about people who just are talking. You're talking about people who actually were involved in political struggle, political resistance with, with the, you know, the, the racial animus in the United States. Mm -hmm. Not for play play, but for real, real. Right. Okay. They were no, on just, the ground. They were on the ground. Mm -hmm. Boots on the ground. On the ground. <laughs> okay. Look at the names. <laughs> Congressman Walter Fontroy, mm. Reverend Jesse Jackson, Coretta Scott King, Bobby Seale, Betty Shabazz. Okay. Now you ain't talk. You talking about? You got royalty here in terms of black nationalism or black progress. Cause it don't get no more royal than the widows of the men who died for this. You understand what I'm saying? Yes, sir. Yeah. You got Coretta Scott King mm -hmm. and Betty Shabazz and Bobby Seale. You got everything there. You got the black Muslims. You got the Black Panthers mm -hmm. and you got that SCLC, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Right. Yep. And you got SNCC. Mm. Do you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Yep. The potential for this moment was, was, was incredible. Oh my God. The potential was about self-determination. Oh my God. It was about the desire to be self-governing and to develop a political in agenda that was practical with people who are already in politics, who recently didn't even have the capacity to vote. Right. Do you feel what I'm saying? Yes, sir. People out there who had boots on the ground. It wasn't talking. It wasn't gesturing. These people had just got out of one political situation, which basically helped propel us to where we are, so-called where we are today. Well, where we can go now, cool our water with the white man ice. Not, not to be disrespectful or whatever the case may be. I'm not trying to be, you know, a, a racial rabble rouser right now. I'm just telling mm -hmm. you the truth. No. Okay. They were born. They were born into a segregated Jim Crow society. Yes, sir. That disenfranchised them. This is the first generation of black people to be formally free. The first generation. Mm. After, after the Civil Rights Act, Acts of 1964, 1965, this is the first generation. They are adults entering into a society where they have legal status, the ability to vote for the first time, collectively, collectively. Mm -hmm. Right. That's what's profound. The first, they're, they're, they're in their, they're in their thirties. These are black people. Most of them are either in their 30s, they're in their 40s, 45 years old. Some of these folks have been on the battlefield for a long time. 50s, in their 50s. <laughs> yes, yes, sir. We're talking about 30 and up. Okay? And this is their first, this is the first step towards what political scientists were called incorporation, the incorporation of black people into the United States, the mainstream. Now, what's, inter what's interesting also about this, this meeting was, or this convention was a place 
an opportunity for anybody who was black. If there was an, any, you know, any internal grievances amongst us, they could have voiced it right there. Am I wrong or am I right? Well, exactly. the ideological differences are clear in the people that are showing up. They're, 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 it's already clear. And nobody is underestimating the, the potential of this moment because you've already had the deaths of, of, of Malcolm and Martin. There's no light. There's no lightness about this. They know the weight of this moment. They know the weight of the time period. And they know that lives have, have, have been lost. Blood has been shed at every level. It's a powerful moment. So we deal with, we, 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 we deal with, okay, go ahead. There's a name that I want y'all to think about. I'm not, I'm not gonna say too much about this because this is gonna be important as we move forward in the conversation. Shirley Chisholm. Mm. Mm. Shirley Chisholm mm -hmm. out of Brooklyn, New York. Who ran for the presidency? Nineteen seventy-two. Mm. Where is she? Wow. Where is Shirley Chisholm? I'm just gonna leave that there. <laughs> hey, bro, you gotta enlighten us, okay? But let me let me keep pushing because you know we got a little bit of ground to cover. Let's check it. Oh, oh, what? Harry Belafonte, <laughs> Ben Branch, Phil Cochran, Dick Gregory, Isaac Hayes, the Jackson family, Byron Loses, <laughs> Queen Mother Moore, Richard Roundtree, Owusu Sadakai, and Wali Sidio, or, or Sadiq, sorry. So you got all of these people from different, like you said, ideological, you know, mm -hmm. positions right. coming together. As free people for the first time in the United States, politically and socially, to decide collectively what their future is going to be about. Yep. Activists, organizations, and even entertainers, <laughs> actors, musicians, all on the stage together. Right. Let's keep going. Hey, you stop. Okay. Uh -oh, uh -oh. No, just wanted to say shout out to Sidney Poitier, who passed away, age of shout 94, out. you know, narrating uh, the documentary. So we just had to put that on the table. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. that we, in order to understand where we are going, must probe our bitter past where we have been. This is not the first time blacks have assembled to chart their political course. 1855, 1871, 1872. These were years in which na national black political conventions met in New York, Columbia, South Carolina, and in New Orleans. Now, some of the white news media. Uh, let me let me just stop for one second, because I want I want something to be said about this a little bit further than what has been said before by us. Notice the diversity of people presented at this conference. Just looking at it, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Not only do you have black men present, mm -hmm. but many, many, many black women are present as well. Now, this stands, I think, in direct contradistinction to the claim made by black lesbian feminist women who made up the Combahee River Collective, mm. who yeah. rejected black nationalism 
and, and, and first of all, let me just say this. Black nationalism is not uniform. It's not a monolith. This is black nationalism. Or it could have been. People from different perspectives, different ideals, holding different ideals, people from different walks of life, different professions, different levels of education, all coming together to determine what exactly black nationalism is about to be. Okay? It could have become anything that we made it to be as a people. But they rejected black nationalism and they only explain one variant of it or one perspective of it. They basically typecasted it and demonized it and caricaturized it as sexist, chauvinistic and not inclusive enough to accommodate women and their needs. But looking at this picture here, how? Right. How, Sway? Right. How? And let me, before I even go further, let me just say this, in case people don't know. Most of the members of the Black Panther Party were women. Yep. I was just about to say it. Yep. If you don't understand, you need to, you need to get it. That deserves a bomb. Most of the members of the Black Panther Party were women. Black women. Women were involved in the S L, you know, the uh, SCLC, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Women were involved in SNCC. They were in the US organization. Women were not left out of the political musings of black men in somewhere. Some do they look like they're in the kitchen? They comprise the majority in a lot of these organizations. Can I, can I say something? Go ahead, bro. The black social contract was still intact. Uh oh. Mm. Black social contract before it was broken. We haven't gotten there yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're talking about a contract between black men and black women that transcended ideology, that transcended class, it transcended so many things that was still there in 1972. Yeah. Still mm, there. Mm, mm. Still, there. still intact. Mm -hmm. You know what? You know, I've read the Combahee River Collective to the, the, the crowd here before, okay? And ultimately, what they did was, like I said, they caricaturized it as something that was oppressive to women because the men, you know, are chauvinistic. They're sexist. Who wants to work with people like this? Who wants to, you know, deal with the issues that these men have? We need to work on ourselves because we're the most oppressed. Now, I mean, at a time when, you know, black folks were looking to build a coalition and to develop, you know, a consensus and to achieve unity along some kind of political lines, you have a group of people saying, you know what? Here's our opportunity to look out for us, for ourselves. Now, those are the facts. And, and who, who, are, who are they getting their cues from? White women. Where are the where, where are the, where, where where are these ideas coming from? White where, women. Uh, where do they get this this notion that these ideas that somehow or another that black men have this overarching, despotic, mm -hmm. tyrannical, mm -hmm. hegemonic mm -hmm. relationship toward black women? Where is this stuff coming from? We already know. Racist social science mm. that the white feminists then use in order to stereotype and caricaturize black men. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, 
a lot of these women, you know, listen to the narratives of some women who went through some, you know, rocky situations or whatever the case may be, had some bad experiences with men. And so, like, their voices become the paramount voice eventually in the black community. Not because it's the actual ideals that most black people hold. It's because it's the idea or the viewpoint that is promoted, endorsed, and proliferated by who, what, what people. <laughs> you know what people. It's these women. Okay, but, but they have partners in crime too. They're, they're not working, you know, apart from, you know, the guys, the, the white dudes. You know, they, they have a coalition. They know what they know what to do. They know how to, you know, in perform psychological operations and counterinsurgency measures. This is what they specialize in. They wrote the book on it. So so you gotta think about you gotta think about Becky. You got to think about Karen. They they graduated from Smith College. They graduated from Wellesley College. They graduated from all of these Northeastern small liberal arts colleges for women. And they went down south and they went and they threw themselves, at least in their minds, got involved in the civil rights struggles and what have you and they got in the ear of black women. They got in the ear of the SNCC women. And they influenced these women and told these women that there is something wrong with the way in which these organizations are operating with men at the top. And from their perspectives, women at the bottom. And that's where it is. That is where it begins and that's where it leads to um, the Kahambi River Collective and all of the other feminists who were never activists other than Angela Davis, because you got to think about that. Which feminists were truly activists from that generation? Other than Angela, Angela, other Angela than, Davis. Other Angela than, Davis. Other than Angela Davis. Hmm. Bell Hooks wasn't no activist. Michelle Wallace wasn't no activist. She wasn't on the ground. Michelle, yeah, she was an activist on the ground. Mm -hmm. Alice Walker was not an activist on the ground. <laughs> hey, man, our story is harder than the hardcore cost of the Holocaust. I'm talking about the one still going on. <laughs> this, this, this still, this what we're watching still predates the investment by black feminists into the subculture of violence theory notion. This, this no. is, still predates that. There's because, still yeah, you're, you're exactly right. Because this is in 1972. Right. The women of the Combahee River Collective didn't really actually make a statement until 1974. Mm -hmm. Those women had an opportunity to sit with these people right here and to develop an agenda to redress any grievances that existed. And to take part in active black political coalition building. They had the ability to do it. These, I mean, these are the facts, man. I'm not like, we don't have time for cap right now. It's not trying to bad mouth people to point the finger at people. We have to tell the truth. But the truth is hard to bear for some people. It's difficult to look at and in the face and to say, damn, this is what occurred. You want proof of it? Let me look. I, I have actual proof of it. OK, so let me share the screen. I'm going to show you. I've shown it before, but I got to share the screen again, because every time I get to talking, every time I say something, people don't believe what it is I'm saying. So I got to show them. OK, can you see that? I know it's small. Probably a little too small, but, you know, I don't want to make it too much bigger because then it might uh, take away from what else it is I'm trying to do. But uh, ultimately, what you have here is an excerpt from the Combahee River Collective, which basically says. Feminism is nevertheless very threatening to the majority of black people because it calls into question some of the most basic assumptions about our existence that sex should be a determinant of power relationships. 
Here is the way male and female roles were defined in a black nationalist pamphlet from the early 1970s. And so they used this one pamphlet in order to say, we reject black nationalism. Mm. Look, 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 I'm telling you, we understand that it is and has been traditional that the man is the head of the house. He is the leader of the house nation because his knowledge of the world is broader. His awareness is greater. His understanding is fuller and his application of this information is wiser. Is it chauvinistic? I think it is. But it's not what you see here at this meeting here. Now, now is it? Mm. It's not what you saw in the Black Panther Party. Absolutely not, was it? It wasn't what you saw in SNCC now, was it? Bro, think about this. Who, who Ella, Ella Baker, we know who Ella Baker was. Yes. Ella Baker found SNCC. What black man held her back? What mm. black man held, she is an icon in feminist ideology. Mm. Not a single black man. She worked for Du Bois. She walked away from Du Bois. She quit the NAACP. She worked for the LCLC. She didn't like the LCLC. She quit the LC, she quit the LC, SCLC. And she went and she found a SNCC. And she did her thing. No one stopped her from being a freaking leader. No one. Was she impacted with sexist attitudes, chauvinism, and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, that was there, but that's all, that was all over the society. That was the culture. The whole culture was, America was like that. White people were like that. White women accepted that. Every, everyone accepted the status of men and women. It's like, they accepted traditional gender roles. But Ella Baker, no one held her back. Especially she, not, she, especially she, not black men. No. Man, nobody held Fannie Lou Hamer back. You know what? But but in spite of these women that y'all are pointing out who are doing this work and not being held back, you know what's happening at the same time? At least. Well, this is 72, so hell, a few number of years earlier and still happening at the moment of this convention, you have the works of people like Gloria Steinem and the CIA that are already in the throes of undermining the Black community via feminism. Already. By the time we get to this convention, Gloria Steinem been at work. She's been at work. Yeah, she's been around Europe for the CIA at this point. Yeah, yeah, she she worked for Hugh Hefner. She was a Playboy bunny. <laughs> but the the but the seeds for undermining black collectivity via feminism was already at work, even though it hasn't been deeply invested in yet by black women in particular, politically, socially, or otherwise, or ideologically. But it's still in its its infancy. Yeah, and it's been suppressed by white America. It's been suppressed by white intellectuals. That's the other part of it. Mm -hmm. that the white intellectuals have suppressed that mm -hmm. for their own purposes on the left liberals etc they've kept that under wraps yes but also i want to draw your attention to this fact because we ain't even got into the video yet you know uh but ultimately i think that it is absurd to argue that black women were ignored they were suppressed by black men who, by the way, I mean, even today or perceived as objectively understood to be the most progressive in relation to, you know, the issues that are so-called most, you know, pressing to feminists, namely, you know, black women having political autonomy, black women being able to hold a job and positions, being able to make decisions in the context of the family. I mean, these are facts. All you got to do is look it up. They, we spend more time with our kids when we have access to them than other men from other races. But yet and still, we get typecast as these brutalizers, these savages. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's become the predominant way to characterize us and to make excuses for these people who basically are opportunists as far as I'm concerned. They are enthralled 
with neoliberal capitalism and the narrative about how black men are savage in order that they can gain easier access to it. That's just my viewpoint. And how to, part of it is how to become white. How to become white women. Mm. How to approximate the privileges, the status, the goodies, everything that comes with white women. Womanhood. So we have to be honest about the main, the, the major streams of black feminism that has always been oriented towards approximating white womanhood and getting everything that the white woman has. And you can't really do that if you are aligned or too connected to black men. Mm. You just can't do it. So you have to side with white society. You have to, you, have to, you have to side with white men. Because one of the features of, of, of feminist, black feminist politics and ideology is an omission of the white male's role in the condition of black women. There was yeah. never any conversation or discussion of what white men have done in relationship to where black women stand in America. It is always so, about black men. So they, you know, they got this one uh, recent, you know, uh, scholar. In 2005, she wrote a paper. Uh, and the, the title of the paper is, uh, if, if my memory serves me correctly, uh, it's about, uh, what's the name uh, of that paper? It's, it's hold on, let me, to, to build a nation. Black women, writers, black nationalism, and the violent reduction of wholeness. So uh, let, me, let me explain to you from the title. To build a nation, black women, writers, black nationalism, and the violent reduction of wholeness. Essentially what that means to me is black unity is violent. Mm. Mm. This is a black feminist. Black nationalism is violent. It supports violence of women. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not going to show you, but understand it's a woman named Amanda Davis. She wrote this article. It's published in uh, uh, Frontiers, a journal of women's studies. Okay. Mm. And basically, this is what she says. For African-American writers in the 60s and 70s, interpreting black experience largely meant doing so in the context of the black nationalist movement. With its emphasis on community, a revolutionary future, and present subjectivity, which, what does that even mean? Black nationalism was proposed as the route to liberation. Liberation that was to garner support in the works of black artists and in the development of a black aesthetic distressed racial stability and solidarity. Yet, in the midst of these shaping forces, African-American women writers such as Alice Walker, Gail Jones, Tony K. Bambara, Tony Morrison, Natsaki Shange, and Louise Merriweather complicated notions of black unity and revolution by collectively showing that nation building could not occur without discussing the relationship between black men and women and addressing the specific realities of black women's lives. Mm. Though a scholar, Madhu Dubi suggests, they were accused of portraying gender divisions at a time when black nationalism required literary affirmation of a cohesive racial community. They challenged the movement's reluctance to articulate viable alternatives for African-American women. Like what alternatives? Being a leader like Ella Baker? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, what's the idea here? Okay, I, I, I'm, I'm lost. I'm, I, I'm telling you I'm lost. This. Can I, can I, can I, let me, can I, let me just say this. Um, I just did a, a stream on black men and feminism. Um, this week. Oh my God. We have to ask the question, who are these women? What, where are they coming from? Who are their parents? What, what is their class location? Who paid them? Yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean, are we talking about 
But so, welcome uh, to the are, are we talking about an upper middle class to the to the black woman or a mixed race woman? She got one white parent, one black parent. We're talking about a lesbian. We're talking about somebody like Elisa Garza, who did not grow up around black people. Mm. And everything that they know about black people comes from the interpretations of, of other middle class, or upper middle class black people who had no direct existential experience with black people. So think about this, Michelle Wallace, Michelle Wallace, you know, the black macho woman. She grew up middle class. She had no real experience with the black majority. When she writes about black people in that book, at least allegedly writes about black people in that book, she is writing from the standpoint of someone who lived a relatively sheltered life in relationships with the black majority. Mm -hmm. Everything that she saw about the movement, civil rights and, and the like, it came from TV. And so what you have is when you go up to, to, to 2005, even our generation, Gen X, and even up in today, you have these people who call themselves black feminists who are existentially removed in terms of their lived conditions from black people. What they understand about black people and black politics is solely derived from some theory, some mythology, something that is passed down from literary figures. And so we have to really, really question the, the kinds of conclusions that they make. That's why that's why it was important when we started this, when, you, when you started the GG, the video, we accented the fact that these were black people who were on the ground. Mm -hmm. These are black people who have lived, Jesse Jackson had a lived experience, okay? Everybody else there at that convention, they lived it. It's black, being a black person is not some theory. Being a black person is what you live. And so with these feminists, these black feminists in particular, we got to put, we, we have to really radically scrutinize them in relationship to the lived experience. Who are you? Where do you come from? Who is your mama? Who is your daddy? What is your class location? All of these things, where are you getting your ideas from? Because they're good with words. They're good with, with what I'm gonna use a, a, a feminist, uh, the language of a feminist. They're good with, uh, <laughs> Verbal diarrhea. I'll put it like that. <laughs> right. from Simone uh, de Bravier, the French feminist. Verbal diarrhea. Mm -hmm. They are they are sophisticated with words. Some people call it word salad. They sound so freaking sophisticated and oh my god, highbrow. I mean. If, if you listen to them long enough, you would think that they are experts on everything in the world. Well, you know, um, ultimately, man, here's one such woman born in, you know, arguably, I don't know when she was, but she wrote this article in like 2005. So she, you know, she's probably a new Jack. You, you get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like someone who's been indoctrinated, been taught men are this way, black men, especially. They beat you, they rape you, they they do all of these negative and 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 uh, you know deleterious things to you. Be on guard against them. Now, let me just say this. She goes on to say this, right? The movement didn't see any alternative for black women, uh, for African American women, and brought issues surrounding women's victimization to the forefront. Right. So they were reluctant to talk about raping of black women. Like what black man there would endorse or be, say, be quiet about, you know, like a sexual assault against a black woman. Jesse Jackson. I'm just I'm putting it out there. Like, I mean, come on, man. Harry Belafonte, Sidney Poitier. They ain't got no scandals. It's absurd. It's absurd. 
Like it's okay to just beat up on women like these men there would just be like, yeah, we you gotta hush hush about that. Can't talk about that. But even notwithstanding the fact that most of the hyperbolic statement that these women make about the victimization of women, it, it has no basis in objective fact. Like we can trace the origins of the people who develop these theories about DV and everything. And how it's all just a bunch of cap. It's a bunch of bullshit. I got all the articles. I got, I've done the research, bro. I've shown on my channel again and again and again that women are just as likely, if not more likely, to assault their intimate partners than are men. Mm -hmm. the, these are just the facts. But they'll continue to typecast you. If you do anything to one of them, doesn't matter what they do to you, they can destroy your property. They can assault you, slap you, punch you, bite you, stab you. If you ever touch them, then you're engaged in an act of brutality. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. You can't even defend yourself against it because the narrative man basically has become a lifetime channel, you know, uh, movie or a TV series. Right. Let me, let me say, can I say this? Do y'all remember, and it's all over the internet, you guys are watching the black and white interview, the, not, not interview, but the dialogue between uh, Nikki Giovanni and James Baldwin. James Baldwin, right. And they're talking, and you know, Nikki Giuliani is what? She's 27 years old when she does that conversation with James Baldwin. James Baldwin is a grown, he's, a, he's, he's post 50. Mm -hmm. Okay. And when you watch that inter interaction, Baldwin is constantly trying to correct her because she's 27 years old and she thinks that she has all the answers about what's going on in black America and particularly the, the dynamic between black men and black women. And she is speaking from a, a highly insular, bubbled perspective, okay? And James Baldwin is talking from the standpoint of a man who was over the age of 50. And he's like, honey, he was a gay man. Child, you don't know what you're talking about. That's James Baldwin. You have not lived. You don't know. You don't. You don't know the black people the way you think you know black people because you have been isolated, mm. segregated. Okay, and this is the kind of dynamic that we're dealing with. This is this is characteristic. This is a feature of black feminism that has never left. It has always been there. Feminism has always attracted black women who come from the most insular, bubbled isolated aspects of the black experience and this is their way to continuously avoid that experience it's a way to continue the detachment from that experience but i think one of the questions we got to get to is why because at the end of the day what what most people want to sidestep and dance around in regard to feminism and even the specifics of something like you know domestic violence policy this it was a platform for the advancement, the political advancement and ascendancy of women. This is what we're talking about. And this is what we're still dealing with. Whether you're talking about it then, with the rise of, of, of this, you know, Gloria steinem led dynamic, or whether you're talking about BLM, you're talking about the same dynamic. This platform bait and switches people using the idea that they're about advancing justice for women, when really it has everything to do with the political ascendancy of women at the expense of men, most particularly black men. We had to cut to the core of it. This is the, the motivation why. Political advancement, power. So now you have a dynamic where any woman can stand up publicly without taking you to court, without calling the police. She can challenge your reputation to the degree where you lose your job, your career, your reputation with no evidence. No evidence, not a police person called, not a, not a court hearing had. You can lose everything on the word of a random woman who claims something that could happen multiple, multi, that she says happens multiple decades ago. That's, that's, that's the goal of what we're seeing here, to, to put women to a degree, to a position of ascendancy where they don't even require evidence to change the reality of a man's life. And this is why I said earlier, and we have to get to this, and we I'm, I'm not going to say too much about this. Where is Shirley Chisholm? 
Where is Shirley Chisholm in this and in this meeting? What is her relationship to this black political convention? Because she ran as the first, she ran, and really as the first black person, president person to run for president in 1972. And she had a particular political orientation that says a lot about this convention and about where we are right now. Let's watch a little bit more of this thing. Uh, Cause it's, you know, it's about 30 minutes of it. I'm not gonna show it all. Uh, I don't think we had the time to do all that, but let's, let's just look at some of what he says. Stop me at any moment. Has criticized us for calling this convention and welcoming all of our brothers and sisters. But we shall determine who comes to this convention. That's the right group here. I mean, so basically here he's saying, look, we determined, like white people wanted to be there to see what we were saying. He was like, no, this is for us, by us. Welcome the thousands, and that includes Bobby Seale and Angela Davis. <laughs> I just want to tell you this afternoon, that the 1968 National Party conventions made a mockery of the democratic process. They were drunken carnivals run for the exclusive few. They debauched the electoral process and they shattered the idealistic hopes of youth. Before critical decisions are made, they must be discussed by all of us in every nook and cranny of this country from the tar paper shacks in the Mississippi Delta to the pine hovels in the Appalachian Hills, from the rank basement apartments of 47th Street in Chicago to the barrios of Spanish Harlem in New York. We all must participate in those decisions. We demand that any party which asks our support acknowledge the inhumanity every black man, woman, and child faces in a hundred different ways each and every day of his existence up and down the width and breadth of this land. Notice how he included black men, women, and children. Did you hear it? To demand the eradication of heroin from the ghetto, now eating away at the vitals of black youth. See all the women? We know. Black people know that white society would never tolerate it in such epidemic proportions in suburbia, and we will not tolerate it in the ghetto. to both American parties that this is their last clear chance. They've had too many already. Now, now, did you hear that? Brothers, are you with me? Can you hear me? Yep. Did you hear yeah. what he said yeah. about both yeah. political parties? Mm -hmm. The jig is up. Yeah. Now, what I think one of the main features of black nationalism is black political autonomy to such an extent that you will never tow a political line. Yes, yes. Yes. What happened? Black agency. Black agency. Which is independent. Not only that, so here's the thing, and I'm glad we're having this. I want you to I want you to to to, to note the omission of victimization, the ideology of victimization, the ideology of black weakness, 
the ideology or the perception that black people are weak, that black people are just completely bereft of any resources, that black people need the help of white paternalists, that black people are so freaking downtrodden that you always need a white savior. Just notice the absence of that. Yeah. 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 Let me keep pushing. And those of us those of us already disenchanted with the political system could conceivably turn to other tactics, shattering the quiet routine of daily life in this country. Those of us, those of us still committed to a political solution might then decide to form a new party movement. There you go again. The discussion of black political agency and autonomy. You 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 would hear it. But whatever, I think all of us are saying this afternoon that if the two major parties in this country fail us and reject us once again in 1972, then they must accept the consequences of that act. They leave us no choice, and if we form a third political movement, we shall take with us the Chicanos, the Puerto Ricans, the Indians, the Orientals, a wonderful kaleidoscope of colors. Okay, let, yeah, let me stop right there. Let me stop right there. Look, you, this one thing you got to understand. Uh, like you said, these guys had boots on the ground. They were like seven, eight years removed from real de facto segregation, okay? And, you know, I'll, I'll take it for granted. I'll give him credit and say, okay, when blacks became maroons and they escaped plantations in the United States, they ran to Native American settlements, okay? That happened, okay? Happened quite often. But, you know, my question is, why is it that black people always want to form coalitions with other groups when you don't see other groups doing exactly the same thing? That's just a question. Why doesn't that happen? Do you hear, you know, the Latinos basically making a plea, well, we're not, we're not going to accept it if you don't Respect black folks and give them reparations. Do you see that happening? Do you see it happening with other groups, identity groups? Now, I'm not trying to be disrespectful. I'm oh. just trying to say, where's the love? One-sided. And then why, why, is, why are black people so idealistic politically that they feel like they have to, you know, carry everybody towards, you know, the rivers of justice. What, what is the prevailing, I, you know, thought pattern here that makes, you know, I guess it's, it's our moral beneficence, I, I guess. I, I don't know. I'm asking for clarity on it. So listen, 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 listen. So you've got Jesse Jackson. He's, he's on the, he's on the yeah. stage. He's there. Remember that this is, this is Jesse Jackson before the Rainbow Coalition. Right. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Remember that now. This is Jesse Jackson when he is with PUSH, Operation PUSH, People United to Save Humanity. He's leading Operation Bread, Bread Basket in Chicago. These are primarily Afro-American initiatives driven by agency. When he is with PUSH, he is pushing education. He is pushing literacy among black youth. He is pushing responsibility among black youth. Later, years later, people would say, well, Jesse Jackson talked like a conservative in the 1970s. And in many respects, 
you can say he was. And he was, he was talking about agency and responsibility and someone say well, accountability and all that kind of stuff. Jesse Jackson at this particular moment was dealing with black agency. When you fast forward to 1984 and 1988, when you get the Rainbow Coalition, that's when you find the shift. That's when you find the kumbaya. That's when you find intersectionality, as we would call it today. All lives matter. Let's save the whole world. As a matter of fact, let's use black people to save the whole world, the whole world but not necessarily save black people. Okay. <laughs> and that's, that's the rub. You know, uh, look, I have a quote from Jesse Jackson. Because like what he says here in this meeting stands in stark contrast to the kind of things he says, and this is 72, to the kind of things that he says in 84 and 88. Like he wrote an article in, in 84 uh, and it was called, what's, what was the name of that thing? It was like, uh, what was the name of it? How, how, what, what was that article's name? It was the Rainbow Coalition Will Never Go Away. <laughs> but, but here's, here's, here's the thing. Here's, here's one I want to say about this. We are looking at the era of black leadership. This is the era when we talked about black leaders. So Jesse Jackson and, and the others, but Jesse Jackson, he's 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 on the comeuppets. He is a black leader, meaning Jesse Jackson is not mainstream at this particular time. He, does uh, not, uh, he is not. He is not the darling of the white liberal establishment. He is fundamentally a black figure, a black icon. And there are questions at this particular time about his ability to become mainstream. Jesse is from South Carolina, born and raised Greenville, South Carolina. A graduate, North Carolina a and football player, football star, acolyte of Martin Luther King Jr., go to Chicago, becomes an activist in Chicago and what have you, becomes this major black leader. This is when we talked about black leadership at its finest. This is the golden age of black leadership versus Negro leadership. We, we shifted from Negro we shifted from the Negro leaders to the black leaders. And Jesse Jackson is prominent among the black leaders. And his whole ideology and rhetoric is conditioned by that. And it's when we get, once we go into the 1980s, all of that shifts. I think it has to do, like you said earlier, I mean, I think it, he sold out, man. It's bottom line. I mean, th there is no other way to explain it. You get the, you get off of the Cadillac, you get off of the trinkets and the baubles, and then all of a sudden, it's you, you're inclusive now. You can't be, you know, a, 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 an effective black leader trying to have black autonomy. You got to make sure everybody's good. You have to appeal to, you know, the people in Appalachia. I mean, even this guy does it here, though. Right. I mean, if, if if you look, if we keep watching far, uh, far enough, he'll begin to be, you know, inclusive and, you know, having discussions about bringing justice everywhere. He already it's, did. He already started that. Yeah. He talked about Appalachia a second ago. I'm like, wait a minute, what? Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the question is, why do we got to make sure everybody else straight when they're doing everything they can to make sure that we're not straight at all? But on top of that, they're eating off of us. You talk about the civil rights movement. How many movements spawned off of the backs of black political uh, activity? Civil rights movement opened the door for whom? Everybody. From gender to handicapped, you know, just differently abled. All the doors opened off. The, even if you talk about black studies. You don't get women's studies, Chicano, Latino studies, Asian stuff. You don't get none of that until black studies kicks open the door. Everybody eats off the activity and the sacrifice of black labor. And nobody wants to credit it 
but nobody's building coalitions with us. And we don't even build coalitions anymore with each other. Indeed. And that's the problem. Because to do so is to be accepting of the violence of the brutal, brutal black beast called the black man. Well, let me the get, super well, predator. Let me offer an, an alternative narrative that goes a little bit where you're going with that. Right? Everybody, you know, from the 60s on, well, we can talk about it earlier than that, but for the sake of this conversation, from the 60s on, people are eating off of us. Right. Only difference, I would argue, one of the main differences between then and now is even within the community, you have very particular demographics that began to eat off of black male bodies, too. So what it really highlights is that all of these groups have been not just eating off of black people, but black men. And these and these feminist dynamics that we're talking about, the LGB type dynamics that extend out of the black community, decide to eat off of heterosexual black male bodies, too. And they still are. There's Man. a show I'm about to review that just co- that's, that comes out dealing with Emmett Till's death. And I'm going to invite you two on to, to deal with it then. But the, you're, you're going to see a political transformation that we've been seeing in the last number of years where you're seeing black women in positions of authority eating off the death of black male bodies in public media to transfer that activity into political advancement strictly for them. This is not different from this time period we're looking at. The only difference is the group that's being eaten off of the most is now being targeted and clear. It's being clear that it's not just black people, it's black men. And what we have to recognize is that as as early as the the 1970s, as early as this meeting right here, you've got deep anti-black male sentiments that are being politicized against black men. Deeply, deeply. It's one thing for us to talk about this anti-black male racism in 2022. We we can do that all day long. We we know we we can talk about it right now. But it's another thing to trace it genealogically to this era, and hell, we can we, we might be able to we can go go even beyond this era, but but this era particular, and what it teaches us is that in this particular era, you had a class of middle class people, mainly middle class women, who had such a hatred for black men that they did everything within their power to disenfranchise, to demonize, to criminalize these black men in service of their own class, their own socioeconomic interests. And that's a shame because, you know, you got to think about it like this. The very same thing that they're accusing us of is the exact same thing that they're doing. They have an exclusive politics that only serves their own interests, correct? So basically they justify what they say they are decrying. They're engaged in the self-same activity that they say is deleterious and unjust. And what's the grounds? He beats me. He rapes me. He's a savage. He wants to be in control. But while all of that's occurring, who's in control? Who's running the family? You got black men writing about running the family. You got black women who are actually running the family. Unquestioningly. This is clear. Like this, this is not, look. We can talk about what should, could, and and ought to be. But the reality is, most of the kids are raised in single-parent families, man. And most of the mamas are the ones who are the sole authority figures in the context of those familial arrangements. So what happens happens is, and this is what happens in, in the ideology, in everything that was written, everything that has been written since 1970 to the present, in ideology, 
so-called black political organ so-called black institutions or political organizations are representative of the dominant configurations of black American life. And what that means is, is that the black family or black family arrangements are subordinated. You don't talk about black family arrangements, that is women leading families. You don't talk about them as being the dominant impulse in black society. What you do is you talk about SNCC, you talk about the SCLC, you talk about black churches and black preachers leading black men leading black churches. And you say, voila, here is your patriarchy. This is what controls black society. When in actuality, if you want to understand the dynamics, the, the, the mechanics of black American life historically, you don't start with the church. You don't start with these organizations, the NAACP, the Urban League. You don't start with these institutions. You start with the family. The family is the basic, has been the basic unit of black American life. And this structure has been led primarily, majoritarily by women. They, and they know it. And they're gaslighting us, bro. I'm, 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 I hate to tell you that. Like, if you talk to a black nationalist about this, and I'm talking about the contemporary cut of black nationalists, okay? Many of them are intersectionalists, okay? Many of them believe, you know, every narrative spoon-fed to them by these women who basically are getting all of their information from white women who are English professors, not even sociologists, man, English professors and philosophers and shit. And, you know, I love philosophy, dude, but it has to be tempered with objective reality. It has to be, you know, circumscribed by what's actually objectively true. But, you know, all I want to say is they know that they run the family. They don't want any intrusion. They know they're the patriarchs of the family, bro. <laughs> they're not the matriarch. They the pay. They the mama and the daddy. When they start saying I'm the mama and the daddy on Father's Day, they mean that shit, bro. Until there's a critique of the black family, and then you know what becomes the lead part of the discussion: the absence of black men. And we've been hearing this for decades. You know about the, the black male abandoning the family, but nobody wants to talk about the ways in which she's able to use institutions to exile him from the family. See, that's not part of the discourse. The part of the discourse that we're allowed to have is that black men abandon the family and therefore any critiques toward the family or the community that need to be leveled really need to start with black men. But if, you, if you want to salute the family, then it's all about her because she's mama and daddy. See, it's a real conditional kind of position based on who's talking and what kind of critique is on the table. Man, I want to give some shout outs before I move forward. Marvin Soul says, uh, great conversation. I always hear black and uh, black and brown, but I never hear brown and black. And, you know, the unfortunate reality is, is that many people who consider themselves to be brown got a lot of black in them. Boricua, Morena. <laughs> I'm just being honest about it, right? They're not just tinies. They're Europe, like especially around the Caribbean. They're an admixture of Africans, Native Americans, and Europeans, Spaniards. Because Spain ain't a, a Mexican country, bro. <laughs> It's a European country. A lot of people don't understand that Spain was a province of Rome. And they may be a little tawny because of invasions around the Mediterranean, but make no mistake about it. Christopher Columbus was not a Mexican dude drinking Coronas, bruh. No. And the majority of the admixture has never been predominantly European. It's not. Man, but you gotta... Man, I... I don't want to, you know, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole. But anyway, I want to give a shout out to Son from Brooklyn. 
Salute to GG, Dr. Tia San Johnson, and Dr. Ron O'Neill for your analysis. I subscribe to all of your platforms. We have to solve our own problems and re-energize. Uh, and disciplined black men have to lead the charge. Shout out to my brother, son from Brooklyn. Thank you, man, for your generous donation. And uh, there's one other brother, uh, Cornbread. He says, uh, Amos Wilson was very clear about black political empowerment. I wish more of us knew him. Listen to his lectures and read his books. I might do a, you know, a show on Dr. Amos Wilson and his insights. I think y'all enjoy that. Okay. Um, but you know, ultimately, and Chris Blue. Oh, uh, I did Chris Blue already. Uh, but but anyway, uh, shout out to all of y'all, man. Um, you got a new one. A new one. Uh, I did. I did cornbread already. I think that's a new one he just put in, but. Oh, but if black males have a high degree of absenteeism and there's a high degree of abuse in our community, who has been abusing the children? Uh oh. Hey, look, I say this all the time. Black men and women are human beings. Whether you have a phallus or a uterus, you have the capacity to behave in a vicious manner. That's objective reality. This whole notion that there's a one-sided violence against women, like men are the only people that are violent in the world, is ridiculous. And to actually sit here and to have to listen to people continuously browbeat us with this bullshit is an insult to my intelligence. At some point, you know, I, I, I got to just lose it and say, man, fuck y'all. It's, it's idiotic. Funny. It's idiotic bullshit. Like how? You're using white women's so-called moral virtue, Victorian womanhood, in order to try to browbeat me and to get me to believe some bullshit. So you got the rap, you've, you've got the rapper Jim Jones who has gone viral mm -hmm. because he said that his mother taught him how to French kiss when he was a boy. Right. Oh my God, bro. By doing it to him. Jim Jones. Oh, my God, Every, everybody bro. Everybody knows Jim Jones from Dipset, Harlem. That's some sick York, shit, bro. Like that. His That's mother, sick he shit, said, bro. He, he did this publicly at, with Angela Yee. Y'all know Angela Yee. All she talks about is sex on her, on her podcast, okay? And you he, know, he, the, the mother tongue kisses a boy in her efforts to teach him about sexuality. And he still didn't seem to understand what was problematic about it. Meaning he was sexually abused and to this day doesn't process it as such. What he said was, well, she was just 17. You see, now you see that? So if that was a father tongue kissing his child daughter oh and he God. said, well, you know. I'm just teaching you about sex. Well, and, and what daughter is going to say, well, he was, he was only a 17 year old father. What listeners are going to applaud that or at the very least just say, well, he does deserve a pass. No. Everybody's going to tell that child she was raped. Angela Lee, Lee show is turning out to be a real interesting segment on how many black male entertainers have been raised in a dysfunctional, sexually vulnerable position for the, for the majority of their lives and to this day don't know it. Man, that's... Bruh. We already know that black boys have the earliest sexual debut. We know this. Who's fucking the little boys, these black boys, man? Older women, older girls and women. Who's fucking these little boys, man? And, and no one wants to talk about the possibility and even the reality that their mothers if you have incest, you have mothers who are sexually attracted to their own sons. Hey, man, this that's why I say, problem. man, we live in a community, right? We live in a world where there is no community, actually. We had, we had community before. Yeah. But the contract, like you said, has been broken. It wasn't black men who broke the contract. Black men, are we don't even know what the fuck is happening. If you don't know your mama kissing you is problematic, do you got some deeper problems going on? This some black white shit, bro. 
Because, I mean, you know, like we're talking about mother-son relationships. That's a fundamental relationship. And if that's pathological, your orientation to the world is going to be pathological, bro. I'm mean, just saying, of, man. Think, think of how many stories we've heard about black fathers molesting their daughters. We, 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 we have not... We don't have the disposition. We have we have not even got to a place where we can talk about black mothers, no, and their sons, no, and incest. Yeah. How how many black men do you think are out there? Black boys, teenagers, grown men, men in their seventies, men in their fifties, men in their twenties, men in their teens, who may have been violated by their mothers, who who, who have no language, right, to talk about it. Yeah. No language. Yeah. If you if you say if you say incest and black community and ask people what their first thoughts are, I would venture to argue over 90% of the time, if not more, it would be black men. Would be the first thought that comes to mind. It doesn't even enter our minds or the conversation how women can be initiators of aggression or violence or sexual violence. Not we so already got the numbers on that too. You know what I'm saying? In terms of sexual assault, relate in, in in a way that men in which men are the victims, we already got the data on that. I already did shows on that as well. Mm -hmm. And I'm pretty sure it's even higher in the black community, especially with vulnerable boys growing up in these all-female environments where they're the patriarchs. And where people know nobody will give a damn. If he says something, I've worked with boys, adolescent boys in California and Philadelphia. And when they're sexually violated, especially by women, I've had boys who have gone to the police department. And the department told them you should feel lucky. You got some. Man, that's crazy, bro. I mean, you think know about this. Think about this. The boys who are growing up in environments dominated by women. And these are women who have been sexually deprived sexually deprived what i mean by that is is that these are women who have they, they, their lives are completely cut off from men and you have young boys who are growing up around them and they're seeing these boys and these boys are vulnerable these boys are available to them i'm not going to go into it but i'm going to say this is that I suspect that when you have boys growing up around large numbers of women and you have a lot and you have high levels of sexual deprivation, they've had dysfunctional relationships with men, they have not had sex months, years, whatever. I think that anything can happen to these boys in those environments. Same with teachers. Any any position where they have authority over young men. You'll, you'll tend to find this dynamic play out. And many of those young men have found out the hard way that if they try to go for help, nobody cares. And, men, and I would argue many of the men in the manosphere have experienced this on one level or another, but have learned to process it as that's just life. I mean, what do you do? And I want black men to hear this. What do you do if you're a young black man and you have an aunt or you have a cousin and your aunt or your cousin may in a, in a subtle or indirect way sexualize you or you feel sexualized and you're in their presence, this is a very real thing. You can be a young black man, you can be in your adulthood or what have you. This is a real Thing. Right. I want to read something to you for a minute from uh, the same literature that the black women in the Combahee River Collective uh, basically rejected wholesale. OK, and uh, I'm going to go to the big screen now. Uh, hold on. Let me see if I can get it. Man, I don't know how to operate StreamYard anymore. It's done switched up on me. <laughs> there we go. Hey, that, that's what I want. OK. Here's what it says. The black family is a very important area of social organization because it is the smallest example of how the rest of the nation works. 
As Imamu Baraka points out in one of his poems, the nation is like ourselves. Whatever we are doing is what the nation is doing or not doing. The family unit is the basis of all nations and the understanding of the roles of those who make the house unified is essential. And then they go on to say, we understand it has been traditional that the man is the head of the house. This is what they, this is what the Combahee River Collective women reject. He's the leader of the nation house because his knowledge of the world is broader. His awareness is greater and so on and so forth. But this is what they leave out. The accepting of the black man's leadership has involved the understanding of the African personality, which has no superior or inferior, only complementarity. The man has a right that does not destroy the collective needs of his family. After all, it is only reasonable that the man be the head of the house because he is also able to defend and protect the development of his home. In understanding the levels of unity, you yourself have to be unified. Okay? Excuse me. Uh, yeah. You cannot conquer the world if you have not conquered yourself. In getting yourself together physically, mentally, and spiritually, the other aspect of yourself has to be unified, which is your house. There is no house without a man and his wife. They are the basis of the nation. As Moana Ron Karinga pointed out, a good example is the best teacher. In teaching the community, nation, and eventually the world of unity, our homes have to be complete in their example. The roles of men and women have to be complementary. Oh, excuse me, complementary. The roles are important in that they in turn define the responsibilities to the home, community, and to the nation. In defining the man's role as the leader, his responsibilities to his house are also defined as being necessary to provide emotional, physical, and economic security. Now, I'm just saying, like, in the kind of culture we live in now, I don't think that's a possibility. Okay, but anyway, one of the key steps in the process of dehumanization resulting from our present condition of slavery has been that of destroying the family. Black men and women were separated, given conflicting roles, and the creation of various myths assured our nation of being disunified. One of the most harmful myths was created by a German named Bakufen, in which he imagined and imposed the idea of the black matriarchy. The black woman's role was defined in such an intentional manner so as to emasculate our men, giving them a limited responsibility to guarantee broken black homes. Since this myth exists in the enslaved minds of black people and therefore affects our attitude and actions, it becomes extremely necessary to define the black woman's role as specifically that of helping the nation to re-emerge. The necessity of the acceptance of our roles, therefore our responsibilities, is essential in making the black family whole again. To understand the importance of this custom and concept, we must keep in mind an African proverb. The destruction of a nation begins in the homes of its people. The destruction of a nation begins in the homes of his people. It's powerful. It's but also remember another African proverb. We are black, mm -hmm. beautiful people. Together, we will win. Mm -hmm. Now, this is what I want. This is a black nationalist pamphlet mm -hmm. that was quoted by the women of the Combahee River Collective. Mm -hmm. But they left out the idea about superiority and inferiority and only complementarity. You, got, you have to look at the history. Like The history of the world is not one in which you got government safety nets and bureaucracies and shit like that. We're talking about how human beings have lived for millennia. The familial structures, the social arrangements, how men are able to take on, in some instances, more than one wife, not because he wants extracurricular pussy, but because of a duty or obligation that he has to make sure, like, if your brother dies in some African cultures, 
You got to take his widow as your wife. Meaning you got to take care. You got to take care of his kids like your own. And and, and see, and, and that is the thing. So this. The problem that we have is that so you, you, you had the feminist and some the, the derivatives. They claim that this was Eurocentric, Eurocentric patriarchy. That is, is that this topic, even this complementary, okay? The reality is this is pervasive across human cultures and civilizations. But they use the rationale, their rationale, that this is Eurocentric, this is patriarchy, this is something that we, that is, that, pat that the patriarchy that exists in the Black community is something that we got from Western Europe's. And because we got it from them, we are the way we 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 got we 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 did it wrong. And the only way to correct it is to dismantle the complete function of men, particularly fathers, within the structure of the family. You eliminate it altogether. And when you do that, you get rid of patriarchy, and that's supposed to open up some type of utopia. But, but, but look at where we are right now. Hey, man, hey. look, let me let me just say this. I want to respond to this guy here, Richard Dixon. Y'all have a good night. I was hoping for a national solution for all of this. The answers, the solution to nationalism are lying right in front of your face. This is the thing that really trips me out about guys, especially in this space. Or any of these other YouTube spaces. These people are giving you the blueprint. They're telling you what's going wrong. But nobody wants to actually deal with the solutions. We are in a house divided. We're telling you how the house became divided. We're letting you know. The answer is not to go have a, a, a convention again in Gary, Indiana. We're giving you the solutions. We're telling you what the issues are. Now, whether you choose to be conscious of it or aware of it or not, it ain't about going to grab some guns and going to shoot some white dudes right now. That's what a lot of these guys, these black nationalists got they, you know, they, they chest puffed out like they that's manly shit for real. Like, you gotta be smart. The art of war is not just going out and shooting and murdering and killing. And, and the other side, the other side of it is that if you don't have an ideology, if you don't have a, a historical understanding of what has happened to you, you have no basis for creating policies. You have no basis for creating laws. You have no basis for changing society. If you do not understand what has happened to you, what do I mean by that? that? Everything that feminists, everything that feminists have done in this society in terms of law and politics, policy, was preceded by ideology. It was preceded by ideology. They created a worldview. They put forward a, a, a set of ideas that ultimately were crafted into policy and law. If you say you want to change, you want to change the, 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 the family court system, you want to change the criminal justice system, you want to change any type of uh, legal or, 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 or policy apparatus in the United States, you have to do some, excuse me, Fucking homework, work. You got to think. You got to open up some goddamn books. You got to read. You got to philosophize. You got to do history. This solution shit, this solutions rhetoric is bullshit. We don't got it. We got, we got Ron set off. He don't get if set off not, too often. If, if you are not ready to think, So all of you motherfuckers, all of you niggas who don't want to think, you can leave. I'm, I'm sorry, Gigi. 
No, I, I go ahead, it, spit it out, man. Stuff. No, man. Hey, we do that here regularly. My platform, man. I, I don't want to. I don't want to get you flagged and all that kind of stuff, man. But but I, I get tired of this, man. I get tired of hearing these Negroes talking about these these Negroes who don't want to think. They don't want to do any hard work. They don't want to do any, any any heavy lifting. They don't understand that these women and these white people are very sophisticated in what they have done over the last sixty years. They are extraordinarily sophisticated, and I and I I have lost patience with black men in this space who do not want to compete at a sophisticated level, who do not want to do the type of heavy lifting that is required to get the, the accomplishments, to get the results that we say we want. We want quick fixes. We want shortcuts, shortcuts. We want easy solutions. And there are no easy solutions to what we're dealing with. And, and you know, all I can say is I get frustrated, you know, with guys who want, like, somebody to come and, you know, like, kiss them, you know, kiss the boo-boo or some shit. Bro, this is not what this is about, man. We... I'm here really actually speaking to the black nationalists who continuously, you know, browbeat the men in this space as if, you know, like they just some bitches who are complaining like bitches about bitches. Men here are actually seeing something and they don't have the intellectual apparatus to actually, you know, state what it really and truly is. But the black nationalists already understood. If your family is fucked up, you don't have a nation, bro. It doesn't exist. You can't have a nation without families. At the very same time we talking about this, you got black feminists who are basically saying, "Hey, we don't need black men around in the families. My aunties and my, you know, my uh my mama's grandmamas and them, they took care of me. We don't need men around." Yeah, this is why this is why I talk about the gynopotestal family structure. Because you have, in a given family, you have spheres of women-led households from grandmother to mama to aunt to daughter to her sister. You, there, there's spheres of women-led households where men are brought in for sperm, uh, for occasional play, and then taken to child support, taken to family court. This is the structure of many Black families at this point today. So what revolution are you going to have when you don't have a, 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 a stake in the family structure, you don't have a stake in it. And what, hey, Dr. Bro, J is, like, what Dr. J is saying is that this is a structure that has led to ultimate failure. Mm -hmm. This structure, everything that Dr. J has just said, contributes to underdevelopment among black boys. This is why black boys are, are where they are in terms of academic achievement, in terms of reading, in terms of science, in terms of math. Because the women, the women are short term. The women are fundamentally survivalist. They don't, they don't think about the big picture. They only think about what's in front of them. And this is the fundamental problem. And they are controlled by the state. They are controlled by the dominant white society because the white society exploits their, 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 their addiction to immediate gratification and survival yeah now, i i want to get back to the video but but to add to dr neil's point how do you refute that when these women have grown up seeing three generations of their mother figures leading households with government support and those women could use government institutions to leverage their desires even petty ones right at their whim against any of the men in the family. If you're not even willing to acknowledge that that happens, how in the hell do you create anything to refute it? Bro, Doc, Doc, Hassan, bro. I saw a video, man, that you did, man. It had to be within three month time frame, man. Well, a woman, a mother, black mother, called the police on her son or threatened to have the police come to lock her son up. Mm -hmm. Who the fuck? That's not black nationalism, bruh. Right. I'm sorry. That ain't black. That ain't even black Jim Crow shit. Mm -hmm. 
This is some extreme pathology. This is the tangle of pathology that Kenneth Clark was talking about and that E. Franklin Frazier was mentioning. This is a tangle of pathology. Anytime you say, I'm going to get a white man who you, his, first of all, a lot of these people don't have any understanding of slavery or Jim Crow because they never lived through it. And they don't understand the sophisticated means by which they're contemporarily exploited. Yeah. They really don't. Yeah. Man, you talk, I'm, I'm just being honest, man. Like, I, I do. I know what the average college student is thinking, man. And their, their minds is not really, I mean, just to be honest, some of these kids are sharp, but a lot of them are some dull blades, bro. Mm. You know it, bro. Mm. We ain't talking about Negroes in the man. We talking about kids in the, in the college classroom, white and black. But unfortunately, the black ones are doing worse than anybody. Some of these kids can't even read. They can't even comprehend passages. You, I'm, I'm serious, man. This is a this this is sick. What, what, what black folks are going through, bro? It's, it's sick, systemic. man. It is it is systemic. I've been doing this for close to twenty years. Dr. J, he sees the way he is in the state school. Mm -hmm. I've, I've taught, you know, I I, I taught at, HBC, at a HBCU for several years. And I've, I've been at a PWI for a long time. I'm, I'm there now. And, 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 bro, you know, literacy, literacy is not <laughs> taken seriously. Hey, bro. Like, I'm sorry. Bro, if I tell a student, okay, look. First of all, some of the stuff you got to teach when you teach philosophy is some bullshit. But... It doesn't matter what it is that's being taught. You have to be able to think critically about the positions that somebody else holds and, and the points of contention between both views. That's what you need the ability or the capacity to do. But you can't do that if you don't know how to compare and contrast, man. Yo, Some of these yo, kids yo. don't have the ability to compare and contrast. And then they don't even have the will to learn how to do it, bro. Let me, let me let me just say this, man. So so we, we're at a moment right now where you have these public school districts, you know, they're having all these so-called wars over critical race theory. And I'm gonna I'm gonna say this, man. All that is reflective of the deep levels and layers of anti-intellectualism that exists in America, man. We have our our public school systems are atrocious. They are horrible. Our 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 post secondary institutions are much better in terms of quality, um, and there are profound reasons for why that is the case. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is that K through twelve is not oriented towards true education. That that's just just the way it is across across the United States, man. And so 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 we have, and, and even now with technology, we have become a dumber society and with each passing gener generation we get dumber and dumber and dumber and dumber <laughs> hey look I, I try to tell people man the only entertainment that a 70s baby can have after 9 or 10 p.m on a saturday night if he ain't sleep is a book there is no cable television there is no cell phone do you understand what I'm saying? There, even, there is no VCR. There's no iPhone. I mean, later on, we get the, you know, the ColecoVision, the Tories, and the head-to-head -head football games and bullshit like that. But come on, man. How long is a line, you playing with a line, or Pong or something going to hold your attention? It's not challenging. So we had to be able to be imaginative if we were actually taught how to think. It's unfortunate, man. Like, and then you have to, in many of these urban areas, you have to sidestep the public educational system in order to be able to receive any modicum of skills and abilities. Because the, basically, the inner city schools, man, are basically monitored by some vicious people, bro. They don't give a fuck about us. 
They'd rather send us to prison than to send us to the public university. They could teach us. They have the capacity to teach us, bro. And they ran by black people. <laughs> the vast majority of them. It's in this in the schools, all right? I, 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 we we got to keep it real. Are we gonna keep it one hundred percent real? Keep it one hundred, man. The vast majority of these these inner city schools are populated by black administrators, black teachers, and, and guess who are the majority of the black teachers? Yeah, you don't you don't want to say it, bro. Who are the majority of the black teachers? Who's teaching Who's teaching civics and art and math and history? And, who are the majority in, in the black inner city schools? <laughs> hey, man, we already know, dog. But, you know, look, they took discipline oh. out of the school. No, they, well. took, they took church out of the school. They took black male teachers out of the school. What black man wants to go to one of these institutions and teach kids, man? See, and that's part of the dynamic, though, right? Because even the administration, you know, is primarily female. But they do have the occasional male. Usually, you know, that's the one they send all the problematic kids to his class until he burns out. That's the dynamic we have at this point. Black men as teachers are, you know, they're primarily used as babysitters and enforcers. Any black man that's taught, especially at a public school, knows as soon as you get there, everybody's nice. They give you a classroom and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, your primary population of kids are the ones that other teachers don't want. And when you try to develop a program or develop something systemic to address it, you're treated as a problem by black female led administration. Hey, bro, we're in a we're in a hell of a pickle, dog. All I'm telling you is we're in a hell of a pickle and nobody wants to tell the truth about it. And it ain't all went black women who did this. I mean, by default, the default position in this culture over the, the propaganda. See, this is what they do. They come up with the ideology in the university. It falls into the mainstream and then it becomes hegemonic discourse. And then, then they, they proliferate it in the media. They just browbeat you with it because they know it's a form of control. They control and dictate the narrative. Bottom line. And so right now, the default position, to be quite honest, is a feminist position throughout the entire culture. This shit is spreading throughout the world, bro. I was talking to a Kenyan the other day, man. A married man, man. Professor, a history professor. You want to talk about pan-Africanism? Motherfucker, I wrote papers on the shit. Big wig hobnobbing with African politicians. Like, okay, here's the Eurocentric way of doing things. Here's how Africans are patterning their behavior and their ideology after Europeans. Here are the pitfalls in doing that. Here's some alternative ways that you could, you know, run your institutions and shit. Just thinking that, you know, like a a think tank level. But this guy sitting here talking to me and he, you know, he's like, look, the problems that permeate family life in America are spreading to Kenya. My father had two wives. He had no bills. <laughs> if he wanted to eat, he went out and he hunted. He got some food. Now, like there's an entirely different system set up and established. Everybody's leaving the, the, the village areas and they're moving towards the inner cities. And as soon as they do that, they have to deal with an entire different constellation of social pressures. And they have to operate by a different set of moral values and social values. Listen, man, listen, so I'm, I'm, I'm trying, I'm trying to make it to Africa before the end of this year. Kenya is one of the countries that I'm, I got, I got my eyes on. Tanzania is, is there also, but anyway, the thing is, man, and I've been I've been saying this for some time now, man. Um, so feminism has penetrated the continent. We have really, we we really have to watch the continent, man, because they have adopted so many parts of the continent have adopted American ways, not just Western ways, but American ways in particular, man. And the consequences of it is that we're seeing some of the same phenomenon in various parts in Africa, like in, in Nigeria, and even in a place like Uganda, like single parent households. So like in Uganda, single, the single parent phenomenon is kind of, it's becoming a thing now in Uganda, man, single parent households. 
okay? Whereas it wasn't that way 30 years ago, okay? <laughs> and I was, talking to a, I was talking to a black man from Nigeria not too long ago, man, when I was doing my travels, going to Brazil and everything like that. And he was telling me as a Nigerian black man that, you know, there are, there are parts of African culture that are resisting this influence. They're, they're still holding on to traditionalism and traditional families or what have you. Um, but I don't know how long they can ward off the influence of America and the broader Western world. I don't know how long they can hold off the effects of Westernization um, that we have lived with for the past you know, 50, 50 years. I don't, I, don't, I don't know how long. And, and, it, and it's going to be a tragic thing to watch. An entire continent. It would be a, a, a tragic thing to watch an entire continent collapse under these horrible ideas about family, about men and women, rearing children, so on and so forth. It would be horrible. But but you know what? This is the way I you know. The Arabs ain't buying into this bullshit. Okay, I mean some you know Middle Eastern nations may be, but the vast majority of them you know they're not buying into this bullshit. Especially the Islamic, the people in the Islamic faith, you know, uh, uh, you know they're not buying into this. And not to say that there aren't any atrocities happening in the Islamic world. I'm, I'm sure that there are. But I'm pretty sure that they're, you know, like they're happening here as well. Like, I mean, look, you can't get rid of human violence by just blaming one demographic on the source uh, as being the source of all of it. It's, it's quixotic. It's, it's a simplistic, stupid fix based upon lies. If you give people a power, uh, 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 some modicum of power, they will find a way to abuse it. Not everyone, but some people will. It just is what it is, man. But, 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 you know, Africa, man, you know, like it's, it's still underdeveloped to some degree. So they might be able to sidestep some of these issues, but the world, man, is seeking to stamp, put his stamp everywhere. America's seeking to do it. China's seeking to do it. India's seeking to do it. Everybody wants, you know, to be able to have their culture be the paramount culture. I was talking to that African guy. This is a side note. The very diversity that these motherfuckers act like they want to see in the world is the kind of diversity you see in Africa today. You know how many different languages are there? You mind know how many different religious traditions are there? How many different territories are there who lived in coexistence? I mean, you know, not to say that there wasn't any fighting ever, but largely, I mean, they got along with that multiplicity. This is the birthplace of humanity. So you can say what you want to about it, but that's the diversity that you're looking for. And it's the same thing that's the, the cause of why they get exploited so much. That they're not unified. And that's why I say it's tragic, right? Because Africa is the most resource, resource rich place on the planet okay i mean i mean there's so much that they're there not just in terms of natural resources but human resources you know i i mean i mean think about you know bill gates and melinda gates they're over there and they have their foundations and all that kind of stuff and all they're focusing in all they're focusing on is is birth control population control why are you trying to and, and i understand that you know there, there are parts of the the, the continent in the world that cannot sustain, you know, uh, you know, too many people and they don't have enough resources and all that kind of stuff, but they're attacking poverty primarily through birth control, not through education, not through economic development and all that kind of stuff. You got the Chinese that are over there. They're doing whatever they're doing. Um, you know, we can say that they're, you know, they're, they're engaging us in a kind of colonialism, but the thing is, is man, is that it would be you know tragic to see Africa not take this advantage, not rather in at this point in history, where Africa can 
dominate the world. What well, African can Africa can do the same thing that China has done. I mean, think about this, man. I mean, China has over the last 60 plus odd years, China has gone from like zero to like a hundred. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And and I'm like the same thing. I mean, what why is the Africa can't why can't Africa do the same thing? They're not, I mean, Africans are very smart. Well, they're, you know, that Africans are smart. They're that Kenyan, that Kenyan told me, he told me, this is what he said. He said there's so many disparate heterogeneous groups there. You know, people look at Africa and they think it's just like, you know, like this monolithic whole. It's, it's the most diverse continent in the world. All the other populations that you see that are formed elsewhere in the world are bottleneck populations that migrated out of Africa. And, and even then, you know, like even Europeans had heterogeneity until the Roman Catholic Church imposed Christianity on all of them. And then they forgot all their culture and their religion. And they unified under the, you know, the banner of, of, of uh, Catholicism. So, you know, his whole idea was like in the same, he said, when you look at, uh, you know, uh, the Muslim world, they were unified under Islam. And so, you know, we don't have anything uniting us, you know, no language, no religious tradition that kind of bonds us all together. It's like everybody kind of does their thing without bothering anybody else. And that's our biggest asset in terms of moral, you know, comportment and political, you know, justice. But at the same time, it's lousy in relation to being able to stave off manipulation and exploitation and fractionalization you know so uh it's, it's you know and you know i'm just saying man these people man they have they've made an art out of divide and conquer and that's why we talking we're talking about black nationalism now and we're trying to give you the reason why we are where we are and you if you can't get this family shit straight you can't get anything else straight bro and I'm a firm believer in that now. At first, you know, I was like, well, you know, that we might be able to do something different. No. If if you got young boys raised by like harems of women, and they are training these boys to be subservient and to understand their role as being subservient to all the women that they encounter, and not to even challenge the system because they're not even worried about challenging the system. It is about immediate gratification and living off your wits. But it's about, I got to get the bag right now. It ain't about, oh, how can we develop a political strategy that's going to propel our people forward for the next 60, you know, to 600 years. That's not even, when the last time you had a conversation with any black person that's talking about some shit like that, male or female. But, but here's the thing, here's the thing, you know, and I said this earlier this week on my, my, my platform. The black people, let me just back up. Liberals and leftists since the 1970s, 1960s, late 1960s, early, ever, early 70s, they were wrong about the family. You've done this stuff and you've done this work on your, on your platform with, with the gays and the lesbians and the women, all that kind of stuff and how they saw themselves as being oppressed with their families and all that kind of stuff. At the end of the day, the liberals and the leftists were wrong about family. They were wrong about male, particularly male authority in the family. They were wrong about the father, the role of the father in the family, because that's what they have been protesting against, protesting rather, against over the past 50 years. Male authority in the family, you remove it, completely they were fundamentally wrong and we see the effects of the wrong head headedness of liberal and leftist ideas about the family the other part of it is that black people a lot of us we adopted their thinking we embraced it the black women in particular we embraced we embraced this this deep pathologization of the black father. We pathologized the black father. We said the black father was absent, deadbeat, 
The black father was a sexual predator. He molested his children. The black father was an inept provider and all that kind of stuff. Black people, black women adopted that. So black people have to own up to the fact. Oh, 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 oh here's this thing. So the welfare state, the welfare state reflected all of that. The family courts reflected all of that in terms of the, the left wing liberal perspective on the family. Black people were complicit in accepting it. And that is where we are right now. Black people have to accept the fact that we wrongly uh, follow the leadership of wrong-headed white liberals, white feminists, and white leftists. And this is where we are right now. And, and the white liberals and white leftists, they don't want to acknowledge it. Here's, here's the bigger thing. Because no one, no one wants to talk about this. And I, I was looking at someone like, um, he's a brother at, he's at Brown, at Brown University, the, the scholar at Brown University. Glenn, Glenn Lowry. Glenn Lowry at Brown University, five years ago, he did this thing on the Moynihan Report. You, you, can, you, can, you can look it up on YouTube and what have you. And Glenn Lowry, he's in this public forum at the American Enterprise Institute, and he is hesitant when he talks about the black family, the state of black family in the Moynihan Report. He is hesitant to blame white feminism yeah. for their role and what they did in social policy in disrupting and even destroying black family structures. Right. And he is hesitant in doing that because he does not want to get that backlash from feminists. Yeah. And That's we something. have to be we have to be forthright in saying, you know what? These white feminists led us astray when it came down to the black family. Black women bought into it and this is why we are where we are. This is, but this is what makes this moment so important, and why the uh, the topic of the show is so key, because we're seeing something that I don't know if any of you, I damn sure didn't see coming in my lifetime. That is a movement of black men. Now, this is not limited to the manosphere. It's not limited to black male studies. It's happening across platforms, across contexts. Men are starting to raise questions that I've never seen men collectively raise. Black men in particular, this moment is incredibly powerful and it's, an, and it's necessary for us to contrast it with what was going on in the culture back in 72, because many people don't see the significance of the moment because academics like Lowry and many others are not only going to not call out white feminism, they're not going to call out black feminism. They're going to operate like none of this is happening, even though it's, in, it's impacting almost every aspect of our lives. It is important that we have this discussion to highlight what men are doing and where it can go. It's incredibly necessary at this point because no other generation of men have been able to have this discussion until now. And I don't want to see us wasted, wasted talking about insignificant issues. And I'm not pointing at anybody's channel or what videos. I'm just saying this is a, this is a powerful moment with a lot of possibility. And I see a lot of people, in my opinion, prioritizing profit over substance in regard to where we can take this. This is why it's important that we actually, you know, right. We correct the direction of where it's going because of where it can go. Cause I don't want to see this discussion end as soon as nobody wants to put a dollar in it anymore. That's not what I want to see happen. I want to see move in. I want to see men move into action and actually be able to make some things happen but before you can move into action. We have to make sure we have the same, we're on the same page. So here we, here we go. No, here we got where we got to go. Here we got another statement. Black women could not have accepted any narrative that black men were not carrying out. Like, look, yes. we, like how many times do we have to make it clear? If you look at the objective data, black men more than any other fucking group of men are more involved in the lives of their children when they have access to them. More than white men and Hispanic men. They spend more time reading with their kids, more time feeding and clothing their fucking children. As soon as we try to make this shit express using data and fucking goddamn scholarly studies and shit, the first thing you do is say, well, they couldn't say it if it wasn't true. We 
talking about reality here, man. Not about what the fuck you feel or what about you, what, your nationalistic ambitions. Because really, if you want nationalistic ambitions, you got to deal with the family shit first, bruh. They know it. They already been knowing it. They been stating the shit. All you got to do is read the literature. They going to tell you. Read the fucking literature, niggas. I'm tired of the stupid shit. I'm just so tired of dumbass shit, man. Read the shit, bruh. They telling you. Explaining to you how this shit goes. Either we have to accept the fact that all black men are fucked up, but the mothers that give birth to them are perfect. All the black boys are just stupid as fuck, but all the women are just fucking angels. And smart as a whip. If you believe that, you don't even understand biology. Or sociology. It's the stupidest shit in the world, man. It's mother goddess worship. I'm just telling you, man, what we got to do is, man, we have to fucking understand what's happened to us. And if black women can have their own political goddamn perspective and ideology, black men better not hesitate to say, hey, look, this way you're wrong at, boo. Bottom line. And if we can't call black women out for coon shit, but they can call us out for all kind of fucking bullshit. How dumb are we? This ain't a guy shit to do with just being like, oh, I respect women. I'm just being a man and I'm standing up. We talking about reality, bro. Fuck all your chivalry. Fuck your notions of being a man and whatever. Or a woman. Which you borrow from white motherfuckers. Which is primarily how you perceive yourself anyway. Like a white motherfucker. Your success and your failures all depend on whether or not you operate in the world like a white motherfucker. Or able to succeed in the world like a white motherfucker. You know what? You know what you just helped me realize, Gigi? What's up, man? This video is probably the first one I can think of that I've seen in a long time where we didn't live in a culture of mother goddess worship. This is a video where we actually don't live in a culture of mother goddess worship. Hey, bro, look, I, look, I don't have a problem with mother, mother goddess worship. I do. But, but let me, I'm going to tell you why. As long as there's my art in it. And if there's balance and truth and beauty and wisdom in it. See, you motherfuckers don't really want to start fucking with me with I this like Afrocentric shit. Because you really ain't read none of this shit. If you did read it, you only skimmed through it. You didn't really fucking acknowledge all the intricacies of the shit. Like even going back to the Osarian mystery system that has a pantheon of gods that are male and female. The motherfucker who stands above it all is Amun or Alsar. There's male and female energy. There's complementarity. We keep trying to say that shit. That's not we keep doing it. I know they ain't doing it like that. But all I'm saying is, why do you think you got all the fucking uh, the, the phallus symbols up the, in, in Africa, everywhere? Why do you think you got them everywhere? Because there was an honor of the male and the female energy. But if all you're doing is pathologizing the male energy, how the fuck can you even generate life? It's stupid as fuck. What we're dealing with is stupidity, man. And that's why, and that's why. And we're not making each other enemies. To if you telling the, if I make up an enemy out of somebody by telling the truth about an accusation or some bullshit, I'm telling you, black women did X, Y, and Z. The facts are there, bro. It ain't no fucking, it, the facts are the facts. It is what it is. I'm with, this is a chess game. This ain't checkers, bro. If you got a white team, I, let me say this and get it out the way. If you got a white, you playing as the white team on the board and you playing as the black team on the board, you have fundamental different strategies and objectives. Period. If you are on the fucking black team and you start collaborating with the white plan to help the white team, then it's a problem. It's a fucking issue. Period. It's even worse when cats aren't even playing checkers, but they're playing tic-tac-toe. Look, we got element Man. discussion. This is ridiculous. Look, it's, it's not. Black people, are, we are our own worst enemy. The nationalistic literature is putting it out there. It's showing. They cover this shit first. 
They are the first ones to talk about it. You want me to go back to it? Look at the shit. They telling you, explaining to you. The destruction of a nation begins in the homes of its people. But 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 here's the thing. Here's the thing. It's African. It's black. But it's that's you know that's this is universal. This is across the board. We don't have any. We don't. We don't have any precedents for a society that is governed or, or family structures or communities that have been governed exclusively by women that have thrived and been prosperous. We don't have that. I don't care, I don't care what you say about history, but if, 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 if there were any merits to these, if there were any merits to these type of imagined societies, these utopian, gynocratic, feminist, matriarchal societies, they would still exist right now. If they had any merits, they would exist in the face of conquest, they would ex exist in the face of historical change, economic changes, globalization, whatever you want to call it. That's why, that, that's why I, I, I don't take these people seriously when they, about when they, when they have these, imagined, these imaginary worlds where this is, what, this is how we were in this you know, mythical Africa in, 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 the, in the 17th century where you had these villages driven by women or you had these societies. Where are they now? They don't exist. All I'm saying is, you need. I'm sorry to cut Dr. Johnson off, man. You were saying something you had a train of thought you wanted to develop, but man, I'm look, I'm tired of people making it seem like we're attacking women by pointing out that black feminism is a political ideology that's fucking problematic. And the extent to which black men or women basically subscribe to it, it's a fucking issue. It's a distortion of reality. If we can't get that out of our heads, if we can't get it, we can't get that, we can't even move to the fucking first base, how can you get to the home plate? You want a nation, you want solutions, but you don't even want to look what the motherfucking problem is right in front of your face. Like, I want to solve this math problem. It's a polynomial equation. But I don't even want to look at one part of the equation and solve for X. I'm not going to look at the whole problem. I'm just going to look at one little tiny aspect of the problem. I'm gonna, we will need to grab some guns and go shoot some white people. Then what? Even if we were to do that, what is the outcome of it? What would be the outcome of it, man? What's the thought process? The problem is we don't have any self-governance. Those people in the, the Black Nationalist Convention, at least they had a modicum, an idea, like, okay, we need to develop a political agenda. Not just an ideology pre-established, but one we develop together. One we make up together. One we provide on our own, through our own agency. Do our own deliberative process. That's what Amiri Baraka was trying to do. But it was a failure. Because black folks assimilated and said, fuck it, I want a Cadillac and a job. I want a power position. At some white institution somewhere. Which, you know, I don't have a problem with you working at a white institution. It's all good. But God damn it. If all you think about in your life is, okay, well, what's best for me and only me and people who look just like me genetically or motherfucking sexually or like it's this 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 not a, it's not thinking about a collective there is no community if all listen, you got is identity politics let me say something man listen man what it boils down to when, when you look at this kind of feminist politics whatever you want to call it at the end at the end of the day you have to ask yourself the question what demands does it place on white society? Not what, a fucking what, bit. What That's demand, the whole point. What, what demands are placed on the people who have subjugated and oppressed us for 400 years? What demands? 
Nothing. What, 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 how, how does it ask them to realign the resources in the society, to readjust the way everything is governed? What, what does it do? And I, and I think that's, that's, that's the core of the issue. So, 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 so feminism and its offshoots are enfranchised and supported because at the end of the day, they don't make major demands on society. I'll give an example. So there was a white writer who was responding to Tianasi Coates after Tianasi Coates' his essay on reparations came out, you know, back in 2016. And, and this is a gay person. This is a gay person. And I don't have the source in front of me right now. I have to, I have to dig it up. But at any rate, this gay person said to Tianasi Coates, he says, you know, gay politics or, you know, it, it doesn't require the kind of redistribution that you're talking about. He was like, you know, we're not asking, you know, uh, why is it? And, 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 this, and this is a white gay male writer posing questions to Tianasi Coast. And he is, he, is, he is befuddled by the reparations question. This is a gay person who doesn't like the question of reparations. And he's basically saying is that, you know, rape, rep, reparations demands more from American society than gay identity politics. And it's like, why are you asking for this and all that? And, and this gay writer really believed that this was something that inconvenienced uh, liberals and leftists. And that is, is that, that, that you, are, you, are, you are disrupting liberal and left-wing politics by demanding rep reparations because liberal lefting liberal and left-wing politics in terms of people of color, as we understand the intersectionality, all of those things are about inclusion. They're not about redressing historical wrongs. They're not about refiguring the entire society. And so for this white person, it didn't make any sense to have reparations as a part of the agenda of liberals and leftists. So this is what we're dealing with right here, man. This is what we're dealing with. And look, the black nationalists knew we got to develop our own political perspective. We can't just use the, utilize theirs because theirs don't speak to us. And yes, you're correct. Intersectional politics demand nothing other than attention. And they already got all of the attention any fucking way. Because it's convenient for the predominant society because there's nothing that has to be paid for it. All you got to do is slap a motherfucker in a TV show, give them a public, you know, put them on front of a magazine cover. Okay, obligation fulfilled. All you got to do is give them a job or some shit like that. Situation solved. All you got to do is say, oh, we respect them so much. To deal with the issue related to black folks, you're going to, like, these... The contemporary feminists are nothing like the women of yore, man, in the black community. They're nothing like them, bro. They ain't like Ella Baker or Fannie Lou Hamer, dog. They not. I'm just keeping it 100, man. They not the same, man. Their energy is different, bro. Their, their energy is just entirely different, it's, it's bro. It's not just that. They don't have the... They don't have the their skin is not in the game. That's because they're not getting slapped. Fannie Lou Hamer came from the Mississippi Delta, bro. She was married to a sharecropper. She said that she could not identify with the feminist movement because she could not imagine being separated from her sharecropper husband. She saw, she saw feminism as something that would create a wedge between she and her husband. She saw feminism as fundamentally divisive. She saw feminism as something that would, that would take black women completely away from black men in order to advance something else that has nothing to do with black women and black men. That was Fannie Lou Hamer. I'm talking about a woman, a, a woman who was a sharecropper who didn't have a, a damn near sixth, a sixth grade education, okay? 
And, and Ella Baker, even though Ella Baker was, you know, she was inclined to a lot of liberals. She was inclined towards socialism and, you know, anti-communism and everything. She was, she was more inclined to be amenable to feminism. But although she was like that, she still was rooted in a tradition. She still was connected. She still had to understand that black people had a linked faith, that there was a linked, a linked fate. That's the thing. A linked fate between black men and black women. That is, the fate of black women is connected intricately to black men and vice versa. But here we are today, fast forward, and these women are running around here operating as a historical people. And they, again, they think that they're honorary, they are white people, that they are not black. They're not black people. They pretend to be black by talking about by, by, by throwing an adjective next to feminine, feminism to modify it, or throwing mm -hmm. an adjective next to queer to modify it. Mm -hmm. But the reality is, is that they are not black people. They're something else. They want to be something other than black. That's what we're dealing with. Well, they've created a whole new framework, or at least it's being presented as new. And the only time I've seen recently the kind of passion that I would have seen in a baker years ago from black women is only in terms of the political advancement of other black women. They've literally transferred the energy of the, of the 60s and 70s and reframed it, right? Much the way Vivica Fox talked about with Ice Cube last year to themselves. The policies, the programs that we're seeing, whether they're NGOs, whether they're, they're federally government-based, philanthropically based. If you look at these companies like Goldman Sachs and Google and Visa, they, these companies have Black women employed there who are initiating and requesting these programs, but only for other black girls and women. When you look at the political measures being passed, they're being pressed by black women for black women. It's a variation of the FUBU concept. They've nationalized themselves. That's why I used to call black feminists, black feminist nationalists, because they've separated themselves from every significant segment of the black community and they only use blackness when it's relevant to their own advancement, often at the expense of men and boys. And they're happy to do it. They no longer see themselves as part of a collective. We, and if anything, we're there to serve very distinct purposes. You're there to get her pregnant when she wants to be. You're there to advance her politics if she needs you to. But yours are irrelevant. I tried to tell him, uh, Dr. J, it wasn't black men who broke the contract. I keep trying to, like, it, it doesn't matter how many times I say it. It's always going to be somebody that says, well, what about the guy who just has sex with a woman and exploits her and then moves on, has no responsibility, doesn't want to take care of the kids? None of that. How many times do we have shows about men trying to go see their kids, but it's a woman trying to run interference from it? Mm. Mm. Who initiates most of the divorces when it comes to family life in the in in the, in the first place? Mm -hmm. Like I mean, like we we don't have a realistic concept, man, about accountability. Anytime it, it, you it, even if you mention accountability for women, then the first thing is going to be, well, what did you do? Well, they have to be right because why would they be doing what they're doing if? It wasn't right that they they weren't exposed to such X, Y, and Zs and, and, and so on and so forth. That's some bullshit, man. That's not even it's not even thinking through a problem. You have <laughs> like we we do research, man. We we're showing you papers, you know, with scientific data, social scientific data, objective, qualitative, and quantitative studies demonstrating facts about the world. And then what do we do? Well, you know. You shouldn't have got her pregnant, bro. Like, dog, man, look. I just don't know what to do with black folks, man. Like, I I feel like we at an all-time low. I, th I think Listen. that there's no, I think there's no critical thinking amongst us. I think that, you know, uh, most black men are pre-Oedipal. We ain't even got to the Oedipus stage where you're trying to fight the father and you got a problem with the father. 
You just only identify with the mother. Like that's it. Like the only, the only, it's gotten to the point where even black men, like in this space, we only want to hear information from women. It's, I mean, I'm just, I'm keeping it 100. That's why, like, I ain't gonna say that's why I totally backed out. I'm working on something right now. But the whole point is, like, damn, we can't even talk to you no more. We can't, but we never were able to talk to you in the first place because you was pre edible You looking for a hit of your mother's milk. Like, I can't solve that problem, bro. Like, I can't get, I can't slice through, I can't cut through that fog in your life. I can't do it, man. And I got a desire to protect the women around me, especially if they're loyal to me. But if, you know, like, as soon as a woman sends you to court, dog, she is your enemy, bro. Sorry. There ain't nothing more clear to a motherfucker when you see verses on a piece of paper, dog. You versus them. How many black men taking women to court, dog, about anything, bro? But listen, but listen, but listen. Who else? Who else? Who, who else holds the kind of conversation that we're having right now? We're, we're talking people, about man. black men. We're not just talking about black men. Man. We're talking about the, the 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 state of Black America right now. We're talking about black men and black women. We're talking about the future of us. What what black women are talking about this? I I I, I can't think of anywhere. In media, in academia, where you have black women who are educated, who have PhDs, master's degrees, who are formally educated, or what have you, even, even if they're not formally educated, community mind or, oriented, who are talking about the future of black people. We're doing we're doing that right now. We're thinking of what we're talking about the state of our existence. Are we going to be here in the next 100 years? This, this is the way I think about this conversation right now. And the reality is that the dominant impulse about black, the dominant impulse among the black female population and black female culture is to talk exclusively about black women and girls. Mm -hmm. And not even, not even fathom the entire collective. They are not wrestling with the stuff that we're wrestling with right now. Where can you go in YouTube and even beyond that, that, that that's going to start with this 1972 convention and ask the question, what happened to us? I can't think of anywhere. And, and, and Dr. Johnson and I, we are both in academia and, and, and you've been a part of academia. I can't think of anywhere where you have black female intellectuals who are asking the question, what happened to black people? Why are we in the state that we are in collectively? I don't see it anywhere. Maybe you guys can help me. I don't see it anywhere. I don't see it in my world. I don't see it in the books I'm reading, the most recent books I'm reading, the most recent articles I have that I'm reading in anything the last 10 years even with Black Lives Matter, I don't see it. And it seems to me that only Black men, historically, and this is where Black nationalism comes in, only Black men historically grapple with the fate of the entire group, men and women. Let me mm -hmm. say this, men, yeah. women, and children. Only Black yes. men do this. Yes. Historically. Yes. When you when you look when you look at the video we've been watching, you see an excitement, a zeitgeist about the possibilities of Black America, as you pointed out, Gigi. Right after a period of of segregation, there's a general excitement as to what can happen, and a fervor about which ideology to use. The zeitgeist that we see now, especially coming from black women in the last, especially 15, 20 years, has a, has solely been about their advancement. It culminated in the rise of Black Lives Matter. But understand, right, that the, the milieu for what BLM came out of had been, per, had been percolating for a while, right? 
intersectionality wasn't developed until the late 1980s. It took a little while. It culminated with the rise of not only BLM, but a whole push for Black female elected politicians, right? This all took several decades to come into fruition. And the excitement for Black women, be they academic or activists or otherwise, is about their own advancement. This is why even, even in a common conversation on a date or listening to a mother talk about a program she's involved with for her daughter, it's about Black women and Black girls. That's all they have. So when they go into these positions and create opportunities using the resources of the companies they work for, they're only thinking of each other. Look, and it's spreading, right? I, in all my classes, I allow my students to choose what subject they want to write on. When it comes to my women, 98% of them are going to write about Black girls and women only. 98%. That's all they'll write about. You had, you, bro, look, all you got to do is look at the, the Bible, the Black Feminist Bible, which is the Combahee River Collective. And they tell you again and again, focusing upon our own oppression is embodied in the concept of identity politics. They don't, nationalism is off the table for them, bro. They're telling you it is. They giving you signals and signs saying fuck nationalism. I'm telling you, I to me, what happened? Black women didn't used to think like this. They saw, like you said, we saw our face as linked. And they all link whether we like it or not, whether we attend to it or not. Because I can tell you one thing, most of these women gonna have babies by black men. Right. Period. Black who are they gonna black. who are they gonna distance from involvement in the lives of their children? Yes, yes, yes. Period. Black men that they can get sperm from quick, easy, and without a lot of contention. They're not going for guys that are gonna be difficult or withhold their seeds. They're going for men that they can get it from easily. How many times have you seen six figure earning brother women with brothers fresh off the street? You think that's an accident? Why you think they don't go to Gigi? Because you're not going to just get sperm out of him. You're not going to get cooperation out of him without resistance, without having to meet a standard. That's why we keep saying half of black men aren't married. You know what I mean? We put, we put those stats out because the men that they're getting sperm from are who? Hey, man, they keep talking about this patriarchy and this sexism and men wanting to run shit. I keep telling people women are the ones running shit. They keep talking about they don't want to fucking deal with the patriarchy, but in effectively, they have a female patriarchy. They're the ones who fucking have absolute control over the lives of children, not the other way around. And it's not because men don't want to be there. They have it's a, not the case, man. They have a female patriarchy and they've developed a female nationalism. But here's the, here's the thing that we have to also deal with. And that is the fact that the white women, the white women's, white women's led feminist movement slash women's movement shifted everything. It changed the dynamic. And Gigi, you've done this. You've done this, you know, when you first came on YouTube in terms of the, 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 the dialectic between sexism and racism. And these white women were effective and shifting the discussion about justice in America from racism to sexism. And that is to say that the most profound inequality, injustice, oppression in the United States is not related to being, not related to racism, but it is connected to sexism. Mm -hmm. that, the women, that the woman, that the woman is the most oppressed. This is what white women did. And when white women did this, they colonized black women under that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And black women accepted that and they ran with it. And this is where we are today. That's why I said that we have to take this L because black women accepted that calculus. They ran, when, when they realized especially the feminists, that they can move up higher in the hierarchy of America. Yes. 
Yes. By focusing on their gender mm -hmm. as women over against their race, mm -hmm. they ran with it. That's yeah. just the point. Yeah. They ran, the white women said, listen, we're going to take this gender thing. We're going to say that being, being a woman is more profound than being a black person. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna run this thing. We're gonna go. We're gonna take it to the bank. And uh, and the black women, they basically got on board. That's that's the point. They basically got on board, and that is and that's why we have this deep, profound separation. And black women, they they have played. They have played the black feminist, the black womanist. They have played lip service to race and racism. And all, that. all that intersectionality crap is about playing lip service to the idea of racism. But at the end of the day, they believe, they deeply believe. And let me tell you something. I've met white feminists, very influential white feminists who really, really believe historically. They really, really believe that the status of women in the world historically is more profound. It is, it is, it is, it is subject to more oppression than the status of black people in the world. There are, there are, there are well healed and they have put this some of them have put this in their books that that sexism is more profound than racism mm -hmm. and a lot of these women they are they are dead now they are in retirement right now they went through this whole second wave they have influenced the american institutions they deep down believed that, that, that the injustice in the world was not racial that the deepest levels of injustice had to do with the status of women. Black women were colonized under that. That's why we are where we are today. You know how they you know how they seduced them? They passed off a mythical narrative that all women for all time have been oppressed by all men for all time. When you have that kind of macro myth that goes down easy when swallowed. That's the first step in seducing various groups of women across class, across race, across geography. That's the easiest way to navigate women in. No nuance, no context, definitely no historical analysis. But that was the beginning point. That's how they approached black women. Hey man, let me, let me say this. So we got this dude keeps telling me how black women are not accountable. Or they're accountable. They this, they that. Dude, we giving you the information. If black women say, "Hey, look, we gonna do identity politics for ourselves. Fuck the men," and then men don't say shit about it. And when they say something, we got a nigga coming on the motherfucking goddamn YouTube chat saying, "Why are you saying something about them?" You don't think they need to be accountable for that, dog? You don't think that's cool politics, bro? I'm just asking a question. I mean, yeah, it would seem to me, no, man, I'm just saying, it seems to me, if it's fuck me, it's fuck you. Yeah. It's just that simple, dog. If we playing on the same NBA team, and then you say, fuck it, I'm not going to pass you the ball, dog. I'm not going to make sure we get this ring. All I'm going to do is just fucking blow up my own stats. But then I'm supposed to look after you, dog? I'm supposed to take care of you, nigga? When we say black boys have the earliest sexual debut, and then there's no accountability, there's no, not even a narrative of black female or any female sexual abuse. We say that, then the first thing you say is, well, you're making enemies. Motherfucker, they telling you we making an enemy out of you, dog, because you a sexist. You a savage. And it ain't predicated upon social science. It's just a fucking myth. It's a myth. It's a narrative. And we're supposed to just buy into the narrative because what? To make you feel good, nigga? Fuck you, dude. Get the fuck. Kick rocks, nigga. Bye. bye. Get the fuck off my shit, nigga. I don't like your bitch ass. Get the fuck out of here, punk ass, nigga. Fuck out of here, bitch. And that's I don't like why. that dude, man. I don't like that dude, man. I, 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 gone, I, said this, I said this on my Facebook page today, and I said this Tuesday when I did I did a two hour stream on black men and feminism. And in the stream, I started out with the thesis that feminism is colonialism. 
And and what that means is that is that white women are just as persuasive. White women are has been, have been just as potent. They have just been as manipulative. They have functioned as major psychologists when it comes to the transformation of black female mentalities. They are master psychologists, and 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 they, you know, I mean, they, 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 and in many respects, they 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 are they are they are greater psychologists than white men. And so when you look at feminism and the impact that feminism has, has, has had on the black female psyches, particularly the middle class, professional, educated black woman, I mean, it is, it is a masterful case study in, psych, in manipulative psychology. Because they really, they really convince these women that they are honorary white women. Man, bruh, I, it don't take a genius to understand. If we in the same gang, let me put it in stupid nigga language. So you stupid niggas can understand it. You dumb fuck. If you part of the Crips, but then you start fucking hanging with the bloods and shooting at the Crips, then nigga, you are my enemy. I don't give a fuck if you a Crip or not, nigga. I love black people too. I might, if I'm, I'm part of the Crips, I might even love them. But if they shooting at me, nigga, I'm gonna have to shoot back, nigga. Period. It don't get no simpler to understand in that shit. France Fanon was willing to call out fuckery on the male and the female side. We already know how to call out the fuckery on the male side. We done done, we done, done that shit for how many goddamn decades, bro? How many Uncle Toms we done called various men and how many coons we done called various men? How many times, bro? But as soon as you say any goddamn thing about one of these pre edible niggas mamas or something which m many of these niggas mamas is some straight hoes dog let's just keep the shit a buck dog in any culture throughout millennia most of these motherfuckers will get x out the motherfucking game bro for fucking up the culture i'm just keeping it 100 men and women will get x out for that bullshit Think, think about it. Think, think, think about think about prostitutes. Think about how prostitutes up until recent times. Prostitutes. Man, get your whole ass out of here, nigga. You, you're not coming in. <laughs> Ban your ass. Man, get the fuck out of here, dude. Stay think away, about man. About this, man. Up until recent times, prostitutes and prostitution were never it was never universally accepted. The prostitute represented the scourge. She represented the bottom. You, you, you did not aspire, if you're a woman, you did not aspire to be a prostitute. She was an outcast. She was a leopard. And we understand her, her socioeconomic status and all that kind of stuff like that. Okay? So in, in times past, you couldn't get away with that kind of stuff. But you fast forward now, you got these women right here celebrating. You got middle class, upper middle class women who have never been in the position where they had to prostitute themselves. Well, they're promoting prostitution and sexual positivity and all that kind of stuff. And so, and what, yes, is, and what does it lead to? It leads to the cultures would eliminate it. And, and that's the even, even with black men. So it's, here's, here's, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Like black male criminality, when Martin Luther King Jr. was alive, black male being a black male criminal or being a black male outlaw, that was not accepted among black people. You 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 were not um, even among the criminal class. When you look at the criminal class in the '60s and all that kind of stuff, they were Nicky Barnes, uh, Fr Frank Lucas. Those guys were always aspiring to something that was middle class. They were always aspiring to something that was outside of the criminal class. Because it was a stigma. Even you look at the, the, the autobiography of Malcolm X. When Malcolm X was alive and all that kind of black people, if you were a full-blown, unapologetic criminal, 
you were a pariah in black society. You were not accepted. That's just the way it was. But here we are in 2022 because of all of the stuff that we're dealing with, you have no standards. You have no sense of authority. You have no moral code. You have no uh, division. You have no boundaries. And this, is, and this has led to the destruction of black society. It's led to it. So you got, so you got mothers, you can raise a child, you can have four and five kids, three, four different baby fathers. You, you don't have to commit to any man. You don't have to have, you don't have to have any male authority in the family whatsoever. You can just raise a family any kind of way. If the children grow up, if the children grow up illiterate, if they're unable to function in the society, if they, if they if they go out and they and they kill people, if they go out and they do all types of pathological things, you're never responsible for contributing to their deviance. Okay, this is the kind of condition that we are living in right now, and the liberals and the feminists they are the ones who influence this. They put this stuff in motion by removing black men from authoritative positions in black American life. Mm -hmm. But no one, no one wants to acknowledge this. No one wants to, because of what it does, and that's why, that's why they hated the, the Moynihan report. They hated Moynihan. And I'm going to say this, I didn't agree with everything that Moynihan said, but they hated Moynihan because Moynihan, who was influenced by Du Bois and influenced by E. Franklin Frazier, he put they, they they put their finger on some stuff that was in Black American culture that was not contributing to the advancements of Black people, and there was no way to get around it. Hey, and, we haven't got, and we haven't gotten beyond that. Motherfuckers don't understand. Look, men should understand full fucking well because we don't have a problem pointing guns at each other and giving each other smoke. We got all this fucking wrath and rage for each other. But we'll let a motherfucking woman pimp slap the shit out of us and be like, sorry, babe, what I do wrong? <laughs> it's fucking insane, man. They'll whip your ass ideologically, politically, tell you I'm not fucking with you. Tell They not just telling us they pissed off at us. They appealing to white people for the shit. Why we? Why are you making them our enemies? Because they declared themselves our fucking enemies. Not all of them. I ain't saying every black woman is our fucking enemy. That's stupid. All I'm saying is there are a certain cadre of women in the black community who had an opportunity to bring their grievances directly to us and to fuck with us and to work it out with us. And instead, they opted going to these colleges and universities and to be seduced by these motherfucking enthralled ass white women who may have had dysfunction in their own family lives, all of a sudden they decided, okay, well, you know what? We're gonna, we got a space where white women are gonna fucking throw all their little pixie dust on us and give us support. This is where I feel safe at. The same women that spit on them. The same women that allow their husbands and their sons and their brothers to fuck them and bear off, you know, bastard offspring. Them your ace boom coons now, though. And so black men are supposed to sit here like, not scratch their heads and not say shit in order to keep the peace? Oh, it's cheaper to keep a dog. Oh, well, you know, like, I'm a chivalrous black man. I, I support... Man, it's one thing to support a virtuous woman, man. It's another thing to throw on your cape for hoes, dog. I'm, I'm, so, I'm sorry, bro. I'm putting it in the plainest language you can understand. If you don't like it, get the fuck on, man. Go holler at your queen mother of the earth goddess, motherfuckers. You know what I'm saying? Even Nas, you motherfucker, he on the guys in the earth shit. He wrote a song, Black Girl Lost. Gee whiz, another nigga's fucking my whiz. Huh? You better understand, man. Right now, we live in a world of mind confusion, bro. 
They got motherfuckers believing that men are women and women are men now. And I ain't trying to be disrespectful to a trans person. If that's how you want to live your life, live it. As long as it don't impact or affect me directly. But God damn, man, you going to make me accept the fact that you're a woman now, dude? Now I'm supposed to fuck with you, right? I'm supposed to give you some dick now, huh? I'm supposed to marry you now, huh? Because you feel like a woman. Aretha Franklin some shit. Come on, man. Cut it out, bro. Look, all I'm saying is, man, I'm not dealing with the mind confusion, man. If you want to be on some nationalistic shit, then you got to be on it all the way 360 degrees, dog. You ain't got that smoke for the men. I mean, for the women, but you got all the smoke for the men. If men don't become nationalists, then they got they a fucking problem. If women don't become nationalists, well, it's because the men weren't nationalistic enough. It takes a fucking nation to have a whole community of nationalists to have a fucking nation. Not just dudes. Not just dudes, man. This is what you Negroes don't get. You so high off your own dick or whatever the thing, your testicles or whatever. You think that you can change everything by doing what? As long, if I was a more manly man, then, you know, come on, dog. You're talking about the art of war for real, bro. I keep talking, man. I keep saying the same shit. You got turncoats that are men and women. It seems like you dudes don't understand that shit, man. I just don't get it, man. The Haitians, man, I got a picture, man, of the Haitian Revolution, man. Them dudes, hey, look, they killed mothers, fathers, and babies, dog. If you wasn't part of what they was doing, y'all dead. Now, you talking about some nationalistic energy, you niggas ain't ready to go there for. David Walker's appeal, man, the dude got a section in the book or his pamphlets where he says, man, we, it was a whole bunch of Negroes shackled and they were being transported from one location to, to another by a black man who was the overseer and two white dudes. The women and the children were walking around unfettered. Somehow one of these wretches was able to pry loose from his shackles and they basically assaulted the white, the two white men and the black man, and they killed two of them, but one of them was, was you know, they ain't kill him. They thought he was dead, but he, you know, he kind of played possum. And the black one, one of the black women held this motherfucker back on his horse. Basically, this motherfucker about to take you to a, a position of slavery and domination, and you fucking stopped to help the dude out. David Walker went off on her ass, bro. He was like, how stupid must this motherfucker be? How dumb can she be? Oh, well, you know, we supposed to be developing unity. If they say we ain't got unity, we're not, we're not uniting with you. What are you supposed to do, dawg? If a woman tells you, dawg, in, in, on a mono e mono basis, I don't fuck with you, bro. I don't want you around, bro. I don't fuck with you, dude. What you gonna do? You gonna make her fuck with you? You gonna make you gonna make her fuck with you? The hubris of you niggas. It's ridiculous to me. You got these ideals, and then you got objective reality. It's one thing to have an ideal, but if you don't deal with the facts on the ground. How can you even carry out what? The, how can you even evaluate your ideals, dude? Now, I ain't saying all black women are this way, but I'm saying that th these women have allowed themselves to become brainwashed by a whole bunch of these motherfucking leftists, bro. And I, and I already did the knowledge on this. I said the left, primarily responsible for mass incarceration of black men during the fucking early 80s, you know, the mid 80s, 90s, and all of this, primarily leftists. Biden was at the head of that shit. Bill Clinton was at the head of that. They're the ones that push for this narrative. Hillary Clinton on television talking about super predators. They're the ones that push this, bro. 
And now here we sit, putting all our eggs into this basket. And you know why the eggs are being put into that basket? Primarily, it's because the, the women don't really have to deal with the rigors of this, this, this oppression system like they say they have to. And they know they don't. Because if they could read, they would understand that they are not at the bottom of all these metrics, bruh. And that's why, let me say this, let me say this. On, on that note, and I want all the brothers to hear this in the chat. Women who have this victim narrative, who they push over the last at least 30 years, you have to question them. So Gigi, Dr. Johnson, and myself, all of us, we, we, we were born in the 70s. Born in the 70s, okay? I was born in 1973. You have to question these women who were born in our generation, they're our age. If they have children, their children are, 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 are either adults or going into adulthoods. But when you have people who are born in the 80s and the 90s and all that kind of stuff, you have to question their narratives of victimization. Okay, because they grew up in a completely different type of environment. They cannot say that they were raised in segregation or Jim Crow. They cannot say that they lived in a world, okay, where black people had no rights, voting rights in particular. They can't say that. And so you have to scrutinize everything they can say. The other thing that I want to say about this is that for, 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 for black men is that black men at an existential level, black men, you have to really think about your life. You have to think about what you, how are you committed? How committed are you to this project of black male freedom and liberation and even this connection to black people, okay? If you are just an individualist and you're just interested in money making and you're just interested in pleasure seeking and all that kind of stuff, this type of conversation is not really for you. <laughs> but if you have some deep, 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 deep concerns about the future of black people, <laughs> men and women, <laughs> This is where you have to be. This is what you, this, this, this is what you got to deal with, and, and, and you have to, you have to decide what kind of black man are you going? Are you going to be a black man who's like just, just forget it? We we have all these conversations about divesting and all that kind of stuff and everything. If you are a black man who is connected to history, and you and you're a part of this conversation. You have to think about how this is going to affect the entirety of your life. I mean, I mean, until the time that you are, to the time that you die. Because these problems aren't going anywhere. Let me say this existentially. I live a very decent life. I live a very good life as a black man. Okay? I live, I live a good life. I have a good career. I make good money. Okay? I live a comfortable life. But I am not comfortable with the condition of black people. I am not comfortable with the condition of black men. I have people who call me in my world, in the world of academia, who think that I am doing something wrong by being on YouTube, who think that I am, I, I, I am some type of deviant because I'm talking to the masses of black men because I'm here having this conversation. Because these people in my world, academia, they believe that I should be happy and satisfied with whatever accomplishments I have where I am in the world. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, no, I'm not satisfied with this shit. And I said this in my last stream. I told my people on my last stream, I came to YouTube because I don't like misandry. I hate the hatred of black people. Men, I see it at every level of American society. That's why I do what I 
do, and I have long memory. I know that black people, we did not come here in 1965. We've been here for 400 freaking years, and I understand what we have gone through over a 400-year period. I'm not, I, am not, I am not an ahistorical person. So what I'm trying to say to you, brothers, is that you have, to, you have to decide, you have to make a decision as to where you are and what you're going to stand for. And at the bottom line is what you're willing to sacrifice. What you're willing to sacrifice. I got people telling me all the time that I need to leave you too. I got people telling me all the time that I should not be talking to you, black men. That I should, be, I should not be talking to Green Gorilla and T.S.R. Johnson in this forum because they believe that somehow or another that, that, that white supremacy is going to wipe me out. And I need to be concerned about that. I'm just being honest with you guys. I'm being honest. You know, but I'm a Negro. I'm a Negro who cannot be bought. I refuse to be bought. I hate the condition that black men are in. That's why I'm here. And that's why I do what I do. You have to figure out what kind of black man you are going to be. And if it means that you, and here's the thing. For me, it means that I am not satisfied with the gynocracy. I'm going to challenge them. I challenge them in my world. They know who I am. They know where I stand. Everybody knows where I stand in academia. Every Negro in academia, Western academia right now, they know where the fuck I stand when it comes down to black men, black men in this situation in America. No one, no one is ambiguous about that. And I have risked it. I have risked Risk it all. I risk it all being here. And my thing to you, brothers, you brothers who are listening, listening, what are you willing to risk? Where is your fucking commitment? That's what it comes down. When you talk about black nationalism, at the very core of black nation, Malcolm X was a black nationalist. What are you willing to risk in order to be a free fucking black man? Hey, I mean, you know, a lot. A lot of people, man, you know, they think this shit is a game, man. Like, this shit is entertainment for them. Or for a lot of people, it's just, you know, a means by which to get cash and to make some money. You know what I'm saying? Or to get some attention or something like that. Like, dude, man, I've been through this shit, bro. Like, all the rigors, this society, all the fuck shit they can throw at you, I've been through that, bro. All the fuck shit women can throw at you, man, from parental alienation to all these accusations and bullshit, I know all that, bro. I've experienced all this shit. You ask why we here, bro. It's like, damn, you act like we ain't black men too. Then I got it's a certain group of guys who like, you know, we, we don't, they'll go off on black men, call them bitches and cowards and punk ass niggas and shit. As soon as you say anything to correct a black woman, the first thing they do is, hey, hey, hold, hold, hold on, guy, you know, you're stopping the unity. Even the ones that's like, fuck y'all, I don't like y'all, y'all ain't redeemable. You savages and brutes and shit. Fuck you. You trash. They'll be trying to save them too. I'm like, dude, what's what the fuck unity is that? I don't get it. But you know, like we've been through the fire and the rain, man. The wind and the ice. Just like you. It is what it is. We're here trying to give you some lessons and tell you. You want to know why the culture is the way that it is? Here's how it was. Here was the promise of a vision. And here's how it got destroyed. When have, ever, when have you ever seen black men say, we need a politics of our own until now? Ever. When? 
They haven't. You have never seen it. Never, ever, never, ever, fucking ever. Go read all the shit. Now you had men who were wanting to take a leadership position because they had a vision. Because men are driven to accomplishing shit. They are. I mean, it is what it is. I'm not saying women haven't, they play significant roles in black liberation. But then the energy shifted. The whole fucking political orientation moved to identity politics at the behest of liberals. Now it's, now you got, I got this article up, racism and sexism, a false analogy written by a white woman. Cause let's walk through the stages of this shit. At first, white women basically wanted the franchise like white men. But it wasn't until the middle of the 19th century that white men in America had the franchise any goddamn way. Because primarily, it was landowners and you know people from wealth who had the ability to vote and to be statesmen. It wasn't the average American white dude. Many of them motherfuckers were indentured servants. Now, I know motherf motherfuckers don't understand it. Like, oh, all the history I read, I'm supposed to just abandon and accept the way you fucking categorize the world into two parts. All women are oppressed. All men are oppressors or some shit. That's a very simplistic way to look at reality, but it's stupid as fuck. It's dumb. And now we're supposed to sit here and accept that stupid shit? Now, I mean, can men be oppressive? Quite certainly. But can women do is the same fuck shit that men do? Certainly. It happens all day, every goddamn day. All you got to do is look at it and see it for what it is. I don't have a problem with women calling men out who do fucked up shit. But damn, can women, when they do something fucked up, can they get called out on it without some bitch-ass nigga trying to come save them from any psychic trauma at all? Maybe they need to undergo psychic trauma. I'm saying, damn, that's what fucking shame is about. Now, we've been made to be shamed for I don't know how many decades over narratives created by people who don't even look like us. As soon as we try to say something about it, I mean, look at all your, look at fucking Francis Cress Welsing and the shit she said. Look at Neely Fuller and the shit that he said. The racism ain't what these women are talking about. Oppression is not what these women are talking about. Your go-tos, you don't even go to. You niggas like DMX and shit, like the, he, the ones he rap about in his, uh, his music. And, or I, Woman cheated on me, I'd be like, so I love my baby mama. I'll never let her go. Oh dog, I gotta keep it anyway, dog. She right, she right, she right, she right, babe. You right, babe. You right, you're right. Even when you know she lying in your fucking face. It's all about telling the truth, bruh. Whether it's painful or not, whether it's gonna make friends or not, whether it's gonna create enemies or not, because the truth is the truth. It is what it is. You don't like it? Go get a spoonful of motherfucking alcohol. Pour it down your throat, dog. Put on the fake ass glasses or whatever the case you may you, you may have in order to, you know, look at the world through color. Colored lenses, whatever. I'm looking at the world how it is. The documents are there. They, t they telling you what they doing. And you still refuse to believe the shit. That's like your brother, if you got a brother in your family, he say, man, I'm not fucking with you niggas anymore. I'm better than y'all. I don't like the way you treated me when I was younger or some shit. And he tell you he don't fuck with you. And he going telling everybody he know about you. That's an issue, man. It's a problem. A motherfucker not letting you be a part of your children's lives, your legacy? That's a problem. And then saying, well, you know, black men aren't present because, you know, they just fuck women and break their hearts and leave. Come on, man. I'm just, I'm sick of this punk ass, simplistic, stupid shit. I'm tired of it, bro.
Oh, you just you don't you you making you making our sisters our enemy. Mother a fuck nigga is a fuck nigga if they got a vagina or or a scrotum. Period. And I'm tired of motherfuckers saying otherwise or pretending otherwise. I'm just sick of it, bro. That's that's one of the reasons why, man. I'm I'm like, man, let me let me calm down with this shit. Before I have to pimp slap one of these motherfuckers or something, man. I'm just tired of this stupid. I'm tired of stupid shit. That's why I feel like I need to go to uh Patreon, man, and do shit. Exclusive for Patreon, man, where people really actually want to learn something instead of people, you know, with popcorn wanting to have a show or something. This ain't no fucking show, bro. It's real talk, man. It's the real world. Real shit we going through. The motherfuckers will throw shade at you and point a finger at you like you cutting into their margin of success on fucking YouTube. Fuck YouTube and fuck you niggas with that fuck shit. You can eat triple dicks. I mean that shit. Sorry if I'm fucking with y'all and y'all reputations, bruh. But fuck them bitch niggas, man. I ain't got time for that. Male or female. Motherfuckers say they want unity. Oh, well, we need to be together and all of this. And then start doing all kind of mud slinging and fuck shit. Then get mad if you call them out. Same shit bitches do. That's the same shit that they do. Whether they male or female. Start fucking with you and then if you say something back, oh well you know, uh, fuck all this sensationalism and all these goddamn views and subscribers and shit, man. Fuck that. We're talking about real shit here, man. From people who learn over years, man. And trying to give you information and motherfuckers keep throwing mud like fuck niggas. I ain't in high school, dude. First thing I said was, before I even came on this particular show, I said, I'm a sympathist with black nationalism for real. That's what I desire. But you niggas don't watch the videos. You just hear what you want to hear. That's the first thing you Negroes do. A lot of you fuck niggas. You go straight to the shit you don't like. I done read more national literature than the average motherfucker who's a black nationalist. I guarantee it. I done read more Afrocentric, pan-African shit than most of y'all. I done read Chiak Anta Diop's Civilization of Barbarism at least about 10, 15 times. I done read Ivan Van Serdam, Ben Yakin, and the whole nine. Theophilo, Binga, all that shit. It ain't really much you can tell me. I told you I done read the Jacob Carruthers, all that shit. Anthony Browder, I done read all of it, bruh. It ain't shit you can teach me about black nationalism for real. I'm digging shit out of the crates you probably ain't even seen before. I done read France for nine. I done read David Walker. I done even read him on my shows. We trying to give you information and you killing the messenger. Oh, I don't like, you know, you, you, you creating, you, you don't want like to have unity. Didn't I say when I first started the show, I wish there was unity. How did the disunity begin? How did we become disunified? And by and large, it wasn't black men who, who did it. I'm just, just the honest to goodness truth, man. Now, if you want to check the historical record where you see black men saying, we need to leave the black community behind in favor of a black male politics. Where, where do you see that shit? I want one nigga to come tell me who's a nationalist or otherwise, bring me the literature. Where black men are like, fuck it, fuck we leaving everybody behind except for ourselves. Fuck the women and the children, we just want shit for ourselves. We don't want wives, we don't want nothing, all we want is what we want for us. 
Black men are responding to social conditions that obtain objectively right now. Whether it's your mama or your sister or your brother, it don't fucking matter. If your brother called the police on you, that's not your brother no more. That's a nigga on the street that don't give a fuck about you. Especially if that motherfucker causes static and drama. It's one thing if you're a piece of shit slime ball. But it's another thing if he's a complete shit and slime ball and trying to put it on you. All I like is the truth. All of it. The ugly parts and the, the, the good shit. You can't get to the good part until you get past the ugly shit. But it went back to what you said earlier, man. At the end of the day, they accused black men retroactively of doing the very things that they're doing right now. All, this, all these ideas about black men only going for themselves politically, socially, economically. Black men have never done it. And that's exactly what they're doing right now. Man, they're doing exactly. I, I said before, T, I said it, dog. I said, when you point a finger at a motherfucker's three pointed back at you, the greatest trick they got is saying basically, and we ain't saying all black women, most black women are living a day to day, wrote, you know, wrote, have habitus kind of existence. But if they bought into the system as it persists, you know, or, or excuse me, as it exists at the current moment, they can become an enemy agent just like any other nigga on the street can, bro. And, and the thing that you have to realize, it doesn't take all black women. And it hasn't taken all black women. It's only been a segment of professional, educated, incorporated women who have done this over the course of decades. They're the ones who have contributed to this malaise that we are dealing with. All of us know, in our own personal experience, existentially, we've dealt with, with Black women from various classes, working class Black women, lower middle class, lower class ratchet women, or what have you, who are oblivious to all of this. We've all dealt with this, man. I, I, I'm an elite Black man. I, I've dealt with every class of Black women that you can think of. I've dealt with the black women from the lowest of the low to the highest of the high, okay? But in terms of this political conversation that DG is talking about, it is, a, it is confined to a specific element, a slice of black female culture, which is professional, educated, college educated, and, and indoctrinated by feminism, and womanism, they're the ones who promoted this stuff. They're the ones who, who were allies, who contributed to white society's ongoing colonization and control of the vast majority of black people who made no demands. They made absolutely no demands on white society. All, of the, all they have been interested in is in Inclusion. That's it. Inclusion. We, this is the black female, the professional, educated black female. We want to be included. That's it. Period. Point here's blank. The, here's the thing, though. Here's the thing when it comes to uh, this whole issue of every black woman. We're talking about what's becoming a systemic culture that is financed, of course, by white society right and left, right? And it's, it's done in such a fashion where these women are for the most part socialized in a goddamn bubble. Whether it comes to welfare, if you're uh, underclass, or whether it comes to middle class and you're going to college, policies work in your favor. Media shows you the images you want to see. Po you know, politics inviting you because you have a degree, right? Education becomes the doorway to electoral politics to admit to take the stage. And at every one of these turns, you're given, you're incentivized to work to the further advantage of other black girls and women. They live in a bubble that separates them from the reality of what black men deal with. 
and, and everything they see reinforces. So at the end of the day, all I'm saying is when we get into these discussions about how many black men and it, it, the, the difficult part about that is they don't have to necessarily individually stand up and say, I hate black men. They can participate in a system that allows them to advance as long as they accept the incentivized material uh, given to them, given they, they have access to. And they've never had to read. E, frankly, I mean, uh, not, not even that. They, they, they've never had to read the feminists that we're talking about. All these women have never read Bill Hooks. They've never read any, you know, any of these diff different figures, but they don't have to because they're able to sign, sign this Faustian contract for their own advancement. And even though she can't tell you none about nothing about that and how it came about, she does know she could take you to family court. She does know she can falsely accuse you. I had to drop a bomb on that, Doc. Sorry. And, and, and the thing is, I, I and Dr. Johnson is, is 100%. 10,000% correct. But, but, but here's the thing that's in front of it, is that you've had, what we have to deal with is the people who have led it. So I'm, I'm going to give you an example. So like you have a, a person right now in 2022, a person like Brittany Cooper, who's at Rutgers University, who has who is not the most sophisticated person, but she's very loud. She's very bolsterous, okay? She's like Andrea Dworkin. Andrea Dworkin, you guys, you know who Dan Andrea Dworkin was. She was a, a radical feminist back in the 80s and 90s and what happened and everything. You have a radical element who was loud, boisterous, and belligerent, who leads all this stuff, Okay? And the majority are either intimidated by them in terms of questioning them, or they just don't say anything at all whatsoever. And people like her, they push this toxicity. They push this extremism about black men. And they are never checked. They're never, ever, 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 ever checked. So, yes, you have young women who will grow up and they will sign on to this and they will not know all the intricacies of what has come before them. But at the same time, they're signing up for a project that has these extreme voices mm -hmm. who propagate their alleged perceived imagined interest as black American women. And, and, and this has been the, 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 the greatest problem. And, 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 I, and I'm of the perspective, and I agree with Dr. J. I don't want to make a hard and fast distinction. I'm trying, I'm trying hard to not make a hard and fast distinction between an extremist like Brittany Cooper and the rest of black female humanity. But I do recognize at the same time that you have black women who are not as loud and as boisterous and vocal as her who will not dissent. They will not be critical. They will not go against what she has said. So you got you 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 got women who don't like. There are women who don't like Brittany Cooper. There are black women, feminists, non-feminists, who think that she is just over the top. But they will never, ever, 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 ever go public and say that you know what we disagree with her. And in their silence, in their complicity, in their silence, there is rather complicity that is right there. And this is what makes it hard. This is what makes this, this is what makes it difficult to to overcome all of the stuff, you know. And, but but at, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, there's a, there's a white establishment. Here's and this is the point I want to make. At the end of the day, 
there is a white establishment that benefits from all of this. Yep. There was a white establishment that refuses to deal with the depths of anti-blackness in terms of law, in terms of policy, in terms of history. They refuse to deal with it. They rather talk about incorporation. They rather talk about diversity and inclusion and representation and all of that trivial fluff nonsense that never ever ever gets at what black people have dealt with in the past and in the present. And what what's even worse about it to me is is that these people, man, they read history about structure or, or philosophy about structural injustice and what it would take to actually reshape the world. And and that's why, you know, like I, I didn't go into it, but you know, the first wave of feminism was about voting. The second wave of feminism was about being able to get a job and not having to depend on your husband. The third wave of feminism is all about, you know, sexual liberation and the inclusion, the diversity component or whatever, you know, uh, you know, having, you know, people who are unseen be seen. The politics of recognition is what some might call it. But at the end of the day, I'm thinking to myself, man, look. The second wave feminists didn't want to change the basic structure of the society that we lived in. They just wanted to be able to live on their own apart from being able to have any obligation or duty towards their husbands. Many of these chicks. Living good lives, middle-class, educated women who you can't tell shit. You know the type, bro. I ain't saying that, you know, a woman, you know, if, if the relationship is so terrible, she shouldn't be able to just bounce out of it. But it's a whole bunch of contradictions, man, even within feminism itself. And that's why I've, I mean, I've done so many shows on this shit. It's like, why do I have to keep going back to the same thing? It's like, where is our elevated understanding of what, what, what it is we're going through? But you got new people who come in, different people from ideological positions, you know, who, who have like proclamations to make or whatever. And I'm like, look, bro, let's just make everything simple. If somebody is against you, they're fucking against you. If they come out and formally say, I don't fuck with you, don't fuck with them. Leave them to their own devices and shame them and say, look, don't say you're doing black politics. Don't tell me what I should be doing politically. Don't try to, you know, shame and chide me. Stay, on your, stay in your own lane. I'd rather, look, what these guys want to do, a lot of these guys, man, especially black nationalists, they want to kick the, the, the conflict down the road and not get it out of the way. I'm like, man, fuck it. Let's get it out of the way right now. Let's get it out of the way. But let's tell the truth. Don't tell part of the truth. Tell all of it. Violence against women. Y'all violent as well. The gay and lesbian motherfuckers, they supposed to be a safe haven for women, right? If they gay, if they like to eat muff or whatever the case may be, it's all good, right? They got the most violent relationships out of all people. All intimate couples. So you can't escape it there either. Like I'm, I'm just confused about like the truth that people, the truth that people hide, in order to save face, or in order to not have to reevaluate their worldview. I mean, I, I just don't get it, man. And fuck all the red pill talk or whatever. I'm just saying. Yes. Listen, man, it, 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 here's, here's, here's the thing, here's the thing. We have to, we, we have to deal with the fact, or, or at least come to terms with the fact that we're talking about women and we're talking about how women have been understood historically and how we have accepted it, internalized it, how we have been socialized to accept women historically, man. We, we, we have been socialized regardless of class, race, or what have you, to see women as the weaker sex, okay? To see women as, they're, they're not men, and they're, they're less than men, or what have you, okay? And 
women have benefited from that. We're talking about chivalry, okay? Um, women being seen as innocent, women as being in infantilized. So we, we have accepted traditions that do not acknowledge the underside of female behavior. They do not, they do not acknowledge that women can be power seeking. They do not acknowledge that women can be engaged in violence. That's just, that's just across the board, man. Whether you're talking about Christianity, Islam, Judaism, the whole nine yards, man. I mean, African, I mean, it, it doesn't, I mean, I teach religion for, for a living. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? And so they benefit, women benefit from that. That's what, that's what complicates this all. That's what complicates it all, is that at the end of the day, we refuse to see women as human beings. And we refuse to see women capable of malevolence, evil, debauchery, so on and so forth. And that is their privilege. That's how they. That's how they benefit from that. And then when you add race to it, so you think about it, man. Black women, man. Black women get. A, black women have gotten away with a lot of stuff. I'm not gonna be honest with you, man. Uh, white liberals, the way white liberals treat black women. If you think about the way the way white society treats black men, and you compare. Why society's treatment of black men with their treatment with black women? I mean, you're talking about night and day, apples and oranges. When we talk about the belligerence of black women, you really have to look at white liberals. White liberals have not exercised the same type of punitive carceral apparatus towards black women as they have towards black men. You just haven't. That's the gender difference. Right there, so that's why that's that's why that's why white women can. I'm sorry, that's why black a black woman can stand up in front of a white woman and, and, and talk to her any kind of way, or a black woman can stand up in front of a white man and say any doggone thing she can say in front of him, and not, you know, feel the vengeance of the state or anything. Because and we don't want to admit this because white society has coddled. Black women in very, very profound ways where black women can get a black woman can get away with goddamn anything. I'm just sorry. This is the doggone truth. And this is you, you can't understand that until you understand chivalry, the savior complex, and all these other dynamics that are part that are part of it, man. It is just and, and that's what makes our intellectual work and our activist work that much more challenging man hey man i just want guys to take off take off the take off the motherfucking dunce hat bro and see the world for what it is i've always said this all women aren't fucked up all men aren't fucked up but when you split the world into a maniche and dualism and then you say, okay, women are the proletariat, men are the bourgeoisie. All men participate in oppression, qua being men. Like, I mean, like, there's no reality. This shit is unreal. It's just, it has no bearing on reality. Or if you say, well, there's violence against women, well, women really actually endure less violence than men. I mean, this, this look, I'm just tired of... No if you say you want to be treated equally, and then you then you tell me, well, don't don't you're talking to me too harshly. You're toxic. While wow, you got somebody like fucking Brittany Cooper who gets to yell and say all kind of stupid shit. Or you got, you know, belligerent people, man, like you, man, look. All I'm saying is, I probably acknowledge the humanity of women more than most of you fuck niggas do. Or you fake so-called chivalrous niggas do. I'm just being honest. I'm not going to be like, oh, well, you know, I'm going to, 
not say anything, you know, to contradict her because she's too feeble minded. Man, get the fuck out of here, dude. I'm going to let her know I don't agree with that. And here's here's the reason why. And you're, you're grown enough to handle it. Well, I'm a woman. What the fuck price of egg, the, What does that have to do with the price of eggs, man? See, th- let me let me tell you my position on it so you can understand it. And then, I, you know, we've been there in four hours, so it's time to cut out. It's a Friday night. But look, and it's almost nine o'clock. But peep game. Anybody that's here, did you choose to be male? In a pre-born state, like I, I decided to be a male. Before you got here? Did you do anything on through your own agency that determined that you would be male before you got here? No, I know you didn't. So to me, if you're male or you're female, it's arbitrary from a moral point of view, dog. It doesn't give you more virtue or less. It doesn't mean that you're of a kinder nature or, or a more evil nature. It just means that it is how it is. It, it's arbitrary. But I hate for motherfuckers to say that they're looking for justice to try to imbue morality to themselves over something that they had no control over. It's arbitrary. So don't try to put that shit on me like, well, I'm a woman. So fucking what? Well, I'm supposed to change my whole comportment and behavior at the very same time you say you want equality, but I want you to still give me the woman privileges, but I'm equal. I'm sick of the equivocation and the oscillation. I'm sick of that shit. I'm tired of it, bro. Which way do you want it? Now, I'm not going to go out of my way to disrespect a man or a woman. But if you want to bring disrespect, I'm going to give it back to you. I believe sometimes I'll let it go and move on with, with a man or a woman. Or I'll try to make peace. Or I'll try to explain myself. But, you know, I'm at the point now where it's like, man, look, I'm tired of all this explaining and shit. You should know me by now. I have a YouTube personality right now. You should know who I am and what the fuck I like and don't like. Or what I'll accept and what I won't accept. You should know my, uh, I have the ability to go through steps and phases of logical arguments. And this is not just some hate I'm harboring for anybody. But if you tell me you're a black nationalist and then you got a group of women who are not, Clearly they are not. They're telling you, I'm not a nationalist. Not, 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 not. And you insist on me fucking treating her like she's the fucking Betty Shabazz. Fuck you, dude. I'm sorry. It's stupid. It's dumb. You ain't going to tell me to treat fucking Clarence Thomas like Betty Shabazz or a nationalist, even though he was a fucking black nationalist. And many of his judicial systems uh, decisions rest upon black nationalism. <laughs> but if you want to tell you that shit, then your fucking brain explode because you ain't read shit. GG, GG. Man, that, that's, that's, that's an entirely different stream that you're talking about right there, man. Man, I'm yeah. done with it, bro. GG, you know, that's, that's, an entirely, that's an entirely different stream, right? There in and of itself, but let, but let me say this, man. And I, I, I don't, I, I want this to, I want this stream to, to end on a high note. I know we've been here for a while, but I, I, I want to say this: is that I, I am convinced that we are we are in an age right now, technologically, uh-huh. where black men don't care anymore. And, and, and what I mean by that is that. When you look at the manosphere and we look at what's happening across social media and what have you, it is clear to me that black men are not operating or you have a, a good portion of black men who are deviating from the traditional script. And they are saying what they think. They're saying 
what is on their minds. They know that there's something wrong and they're pushing against these dominant narratives, okay? And um, I think that that's a, that's a good thing. I think that's, a, that's something that we need to celebrate. I, I, I'm excited about it, that you have black men, because here's the thing, and I've said this in my, my recent um, broadcast on my forums, is that there's no way for there's no way for anyone to really control technology and these voices. Um, you know, the Senate, the people in the Senate, I mean, they can have as many hearings and conversations or whatever you're with with with, with people like um, um, uh, Mark Zuckerberg and the other technocrats. They can talk about them and censorship all day long. But at the end of the day, they have no control of what's happening in terms of communications. And from what I'm seeing right now, and this is what gives me hope, and this is what makes me joyful and what have you, is that Black men are um, taking advantage of this moment and this forum and talking about their grievances. And, and, and Black women, for the first time in our history, and I would say even within the last 60 years, they, they have no control over it. They, they can't do anything to stop it. Okay? Even something as trivial, and I don't want to I don't want to go too far in this, but something as trivial as, as, as stuff that happens on some of these other YouTube platforms like Fresh and Fit. Trivial, kind of basic elementary stuff where you have, you know, you know, black men saying certain things about black women. They have no control over it. And our voices are here. No one control you. GG, you have a you have a whole, you have hundreds of videos. You you have you have a document, you have a footprint on social media. For me personally, that's just as significant. This is just as significant as writing articles and writing books. I'm finishing a book right now that I've been working on for the past five years. I'm finishing a book that I have been for five years, but I'm not relying on this book to have my ideas out there. Tommy Curry, and I'm going to say this, I love Tommy Curry and the man night, and I talk about Tommy Curry, but... A lot of people will never, ever, 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 ever read the man night. They're not going to read the man night. Okay? But they can Google Tom McCurry. And they can Google all the videos that Tom McCurry has been a part of. They can go back to the Rob Report and see Tom McCurry on the Rob Report and what he was saying back in 2013, 2014, 2015, way before the man not was written. I met Tom McCurry through his videos. That's how I was introduced to Tom McCurry back in 2012. I was introduced. I know Tom McCurry. I've written two. I have written two academic reviews on the man that I have two published academic reviews on the man not. One published by the American Philosophical Association and one pair published by the by African American Review. I met before I met Tom McCurry in person, I met Tom McCurry via digi, via social media. I'm not the only one. So the point I'm trying to make is is that we are making a dent. I want to end this thing man, on a positive note. That, 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 that we are in a completely different domain, man, a different milieu. Every, people know who the Green Gorilla is. People know who Dr. T.S.R. Johnson is. They know Dr. T.S.R. Johnson. Over 20 freaking thousand subscribers, they know who Dr. T.S.R. Johnson is. And they're contending with Dr. T.S.R. Johnson. 
So we are, we are, we are, we are, we are in a great place, man. We are in a great place, and all we have to do is continue to push this envelope and continue to mine this history and continue to scrutinize this stuff and continue to keep black women's feet to the fire as they are connected to white women and white men. That's all I got to say. Thank you, man. Hey, bro. I appreciate you coming to join me tonight, man. I mean, you know, it's a Friday night, and uh, I know y'all are all busy. And, uh, you know, I, I definitely know that Dr. Johnson, man, is, uh, you know, not one for, you know, prolonged conversation and drift and anything like that. <laughs> but, you know, he'll kind of he'll kind of phase out. But, uh, Doc, man, uh, please, uh, you know, Spread some words of wisdom. Bless us with some uh, some thoughts and reflections before we pull out of here. And I'm sorry that we didn't get to more of the video, uh, which, you know, I'll probably have to do unilaterally. Or, you know, you can join me again if you'd like, or I can come on your format and we can go through it some more. Uh, but um, bless us with some words, man. I mean, what are your thoughts, man, uh, summing things up? I don't really have many, man, because it's it's rare that I find myself in company with brothers that uh, I share so much uh, an agreement with that I can actually sit back and breathe. <laughs> I was enjoying the conversation, but uh, no, nah, man. At the end of the day, man, we gotta we gotta continue this work because this is you know as I said before, I've never seen this in my lifetime, and it does bother me that the first people to object to even having this conversation are often brothers, you know, before we even get to, you know, women that object to it and then, you know, all the other, you know, various groups that do. And it, it's, it's upsetting because there's a degree of honesty that you can see people avoiding and not being in, you know, being disingenuous about when it comes to the state of affairs for black men and boys. And that's really, you know, at, at this juncture, what I'm trying to focus on. What is the state of affairs for black men and boys? What are the possibilities? What can be, you know, and, and how can we actually use this moment beyond emotional expression, frustration, or, or just, you know, to get a few, you know, dollars or whatever. I want to see this. I want to see this movement that I didn't even know I was waiting for my entire life up to this point. I want to see it generate something tangible that my son and grandchildren can can pick up and move with. You know what I mean? Sometimes I'm concerned because I'm like, shit, if if YouTube got rid of all of us, does this movement stop? I don't believe it would, but it is a relevant question. So are we gonna take this beyond? Now we, we you know, we, whether that be politically, whether it be socially, whatever it may be, we need to be able to talk about this beyond the scope of, you know, some of the things that I think, you know, the manosphere has gotten quite comfortable in. We got to push it further. Yeah, I, it, I don't. Know. I don't want to interrupt you at all. I shouldn't have said anything. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead, man. Yeah, you know, uh, I want to see more happen as well. Uh, I overshoot sometimes, man. Some of the ideas that I get are lofty, uh, but I mean, if I didn't have high aspirations, then I wouldn't think highly of myself. You know what I'm saying? So, I mean, even though I'm deprecating. Related to myself, I'm hard on myself. Uh, you know, we should be striving to make something happen in the, you know, in the real world as well as, uh, you know, consciousness raised. And hopefully, you know, that'll happen at some point. And hopefully we won't get caught up in the head, you know, nigga in charge syndrome, you know, on our route to doing it. And that's, you know, that's the biggest problem I think that black people have. Uh, you know, uh, at the current moment, man, you know, it's it's like if, if it ain't my way, fuck it. We don't have the capacity to, you know, bond together and come together and actually do anything, you know, without it being a lot of drama uh, and, and, and a lot of creation of in and out groups. I would like to see people who have totally divergent viewpoints that I have as long as it's respectful. You know what I'm saying? Like we we could, you know, still have conversations or even still, you know, do something that we do agree on, like work towards something. But, you know, I just, you know, look, man, 
I get frustrated with this kind of work, man. I mean, like I do, man. It, it, it's beginning to show. And sometimes I got to pull back from it, man. Uh, but I love it. I just, you know, I just, I, I want brothers to stop being so fucking naive, man. <laughs> it's just like, I just want them to stop being naive and come to grips with reality. Like, okay, you're dealing with human beings, man, who have strengths and weaknesses like any other human being. And, you know, like this whole gender shit, like I've taken gender courses, bro. Some of it I agree with. But the essentialism, I, I askew. And I know when they're playing the essentialism game and acting in bad faith. That's all I, I'm here to say. I know bad faith when I'm experiencing it. I know gaslighting when I'm experiencing it. I know half-truths and lies when, I, when, I, when I'm looking them dead in the face or when I hear them. Now, most you know guys, sometimes they'll be like, well, you know, I'm going to lie to myself even though I know I just heard a lie in order to keep the peace or to live up to some, you know, standard of what manhood is supposed to be about. Dude, I'm tired of that shit. Because if you sacrifice one time, you sacrifice another time, and then the next thing you know, your back will be bent over, and all your energy will be lost trying to make sure somebody else okay, male or female. It's, 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 it's about looking after yourself and having a natural love and healthy love for yourself. So, you know, I, I appreciate y'all, man, you know, uh, and I know that I'll be in communion with you guys at some time in the near future. You know, I'm always watching your content, man. Uh, I'm watching you, you know, on Wednesdays, Doc, as you talk about, you know, unacknowledged emotional labor. And I'm watching you, you know, Ron, uh, as you, you know, discuss the various ways in which black men are treated just like the brutes. And Raul Peck's documentary, Exterminate All the Brutes. You know, and that laugh, man, it fucks me up every time when you come on, man. I just need to hear that laugh before I leave, man. I'll be in good spirits, bro. <laughs> <laughs> man, you killed me with that, man. I swear to God, man. But anyway, man, thank you, brothers, for coming, man. We're going to have more conversations about this. I'm pretty sure I'm going to stoke, excuse me, stoke uh, some flames in some people, man. Uh, but again, before I even end, I want to say that, you know, I'm a black nationalist at heart. There's not really much you could tell me about the ideal or the value system or the axiology that I don't already know or understand. I'm just thinking to myself, what the hell happened? In 72, it was nation time. If you ask somebody back then, you'd get an answer. You know, it's nation time. Now, I'm not quite certain, man. No? So. What time is it? <laughs> it's time to get the fuck off of YouTube. <laughs> I'll let y'all later, man. It's a wrap for this one, man. Peace out, brothers, man. Stay in good health, man. Till we see till we see each other again, man.